نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم الهمنا رشدا وعزنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره ال عمران This surah was revealed in Medina. It has 200 verses, 20 stanzas, is the third by the order of arrangement and 89th by the order of revelation. Regarding its name, it takes its name from the verse 33 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about Imra'atu Imran and Ali Imran. and uh, like the names of many surahs of quran it is merely a name to distinguish it from the other surahs and does not imply that the family of imran has been discussed in it it is also called surah al kans and regarding the excellence of surah imran we we learn that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that read the two lights az zahrawain read the two lights and these are what surah al baqarah and surah al imran for on the day of judgment they will come in the form of two umbrellas or two wings of two of birds pleading and arguing in favor of those who used to recite them Now as far as the period of revelation of surah al imran is concerned it consists of four discourses the first from verse 1 to 32 these were probably revealed soon after the battle of badr the second discourse continuing from verse 33 to 63 these were those which were revealed in uh, after 9 years of the immigration of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from makkah to medina and this was on the occasion of the visit by the deputation from the christians of najran and the third discourse is from 64 verse number 64 to 120 and these also appear to have been revealed immediately after the first one and the fourth discourse is between 120 to 200 and these were revealed after the battle of uhud and uh, we do learn that there are certain verses of quran these certain surahs of quran which are related with certain battles which were take which took place in the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam like surah al imran it was revealed after the battle of uh, badr uh, after the battle of uhud surah anfal after the battle of badr surah ahzab after the battle of trench surah toba after the tabuk expedition and the battle of mota and uh, the battle of banu quraiza surah hashr after the battle of banu nazir so here we will learn about all the events which happened during the battle of uhud regarding the main theme and the subject matter of surah al imran these uh, discourses they were revealed at different periods and on different occasions they are so interlinked and so interconnected in regard to their aim the object and the central theme that they just make one continuous whole and the surah has been uh, specially addressed to two groups the people of the book that is the jews and the christians and the followers of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now the message which has been extended to the jews and the christians in uh, is in continuation with the invitation of surah al baqarah in which they have been admonished for their uh, wrong beliefs and their evil morals and they've been advised to accept as a remedy the truth of quran and they have been told there that uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught the same right way of life that had been preached by their own prophets also that is that is alone was the right way and that the way of allah hence any deviation from it will be wrong and even according to their own scriptures and the second group which has been addressed is the muslims they have been declared to be the best community 
and they have been appointed as the torch bearers of the truth and entrusted with the responsibility of reforming the world. And they have been also given additional instructions in uh, continuation of those given in Surah Baqarah. The Muslims have been warned to learn a lesson from the religious and from the moral degenerations of the former communities and to refrain from treading in their footsteps. And uh, instructions have also been given about the reformative works they had to perform. And uh, they've been also taught how to deal with the people of the book and the hypocrites who were putting different kinds of hindrances in the way of Allah. And above all, Muslims have been warned to guard against those weaknesses which had come to the surface during the Battle of Uhud. <laughs> الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم ألف لام ميم الله there is no deity except him the ever living the sustainer of existence in the second and the starting verse of Surah Al-Imran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the concept of belief in the oneness of Allah and has also explained the greatest name and attribute of Allah, Ismi Azam, for which Prophet has guided all of us in a tradition that he said that search for the greatest name, Ismi Azam, of Allah in three verses the verse of the throne of Surah Al Baqarah, the second verse of Surah Al Imran, and the verse number 111 of Surah Tawahab. And when we see the common word in all the three verses is al hayyul qayyum So this is the greatest attribute of Allah Almighty. And then Prophet Sallallahu added that whoever will recite it before a supplication, the supplication will be answered and it will be granted. So this verse highlights the, the greatest attribute of Allah is that he is the ever living and the sustainer of existence. And we learn that Prophet Sallallahu in the time of distress, the supplication he used to make is, was Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum Bi Rahmatika Nastaghiz. He has sent down upon you the book in truth, confirming what was before it, and he revealed the Torah and the Injil. Quran is saying, the verse of the Surah is saying that Quran confirms what was in the books previously. Because we know that, and we can clearly relate that all the concepts of faith and belief are similar in the books. And similarly, the narrations of the hellfire, the narrations of Jannah, the commandments, the orders, the do's, the don'ts, the laws, which have been basically explained in Quran are almost similar to those which have been explained in the previous scriptures also. And then here Allah is mentioning about Torah and about Injil. Torah was the book which was revealed, the, the divine scripture which was revealed to Hazrat Musa salam. It is also known as the Old Testament and it has 34 to 38 books. Similarly, Injil, also known as the New Testament, this is composed of, it is not composed of the words of the revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead, it is generally composed of the speeches which were delivered by Hazrat Isa alayhi salam after he revealed, uh, received the revelations. And it is composed of 20 to 25 different volumes which make up the Injil. Before as guidance for the people, and he revealed the Quran. Indeed, those who disbelieved in the verses of Allah will have a severe punishment, and Allah is exalted in might, the owner of retribution. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is labeling the Quran, is calling the Quran as Furqan. Furqan derives uh, from the word faraqa, which means what? Which means to differentiate, to distinguish. So Quran differentiates and distinguishes between what? Between the right and the wrong, between the permissible and the prohibited, between the halal and the haram, between the lawful and the unlawful, between sin and between the pious and the righteous deeds. <coughs> 
Allahumma arinal haqqa haqqan warzukna tiba'a. Allahumma arinal batila batila warzukna jtinaba. Indeed, from Allah, nothing is hidden in the earth nor in the heaven. It is he who forms you in the wombs, however he wills. There is no deity except him, the exalted in might, the wise. It is he who has sent down to you, O Muhammad, وسلم, the book. In it are verses that are precise. They are the foundation of the book, and the other are unspecific. So now here in this verse number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining to all of us that whenever you read and recite the Quran, you will come across two types of verses. The first type is, as Allah explains in this verse, is muhkimat. These verses are the precise and the clear cut uh, messages of Allah. These are the verses, the meaning of which, the message of which, the commandment of which, the explanation of which, the narration of which, they are what? They are very precise and they're clear cut and they're very legible. They're very easy to comprehend and understand. These are all the verses of Quran re related with the articles of faith and belief about the do's, don'ts, commandments, orders, laws, and uh, the, the, the narrations of the life of hereafter, the day of judgment, Jannah, hell. These are what? These are the muhkimat, and they are the foundation of the book. And the other are which after saying that they are ayat, uh, hunna umul kitab, the other is wa ukharu mutashabihat. The others, the forms are which are mutashabihat, they are the non specific. Mutashabihat refers to the verses of Quran, uh, the meaning of which says doubtful. They are confusing, they are not specific. These are those verses, the message of which is not clear cut and it is not easy to interpret the meaning of these verses some uh, commentaries say that they they are nine in number somewhere we find that they are 17 some say that they are 21 in number like example is that as allah says in quran so the throne of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is it like where is it what is it made up of? What is its position? What is its shape? We just cannot comprehend. We cannot, we cannot understand and relate. So this is what? This is a mutashabihat. Then Allah says in Quran, summastawa ilal ash. So what is the position, the attitude? We we just cannot comprehend. So these are all examples of what? Of the non-specific verses of Quran. We cannot understand the meaning, and the meaning stays doubtful and confusing. So then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for those in whose hearts is a deviation from truth, they will follow that of it which is unspecific, seeking discord and seeking an interpretation suitable to them. And no one knows its true interpretation except Allah, but those affirm in knowledge. Those firm in knowledge say, we believe in it and all of it is from our Lord. And no one will be reminded except those of understanding. So now, uh, after explaining that when we read the Quran, we're going to come across two types of verses. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next part of the verse explains that there are also going to be two types of people. When we, oh, people who read the Quran, who recite the Quran, who try to learn the Quran, they will all not be of the same type. They will also be of two types. The first type of the person which has been explained in this verse is a person with a crooked mind. The person with a crooked mind having a negative approach and outlook. He, the person will just pursue and just connect with the mutashabihat with the with the non-specific verses and they will try to do what they out of total self-delusion they will try to give them the meaning they would want to desire themselves to cause a deviation in islam so these are the crooked minded negative minded people who rather than connecting with the muhkimat they connect with the mutashabihat so they that they can give them a meaning a message which they desire themselves they desire for themselves as an ease in religion and they will cause a deviation in Islam. 
The second group of people who have been explained in this verse are the desired category, as Allah explains, are the ulul albab. They are those who are the knowledgeable people. Who are these and how do they behave with the verses of Quran is that they relate with the muhkimat. And regarding the mutashabihat, they say, Amanna bihi kullum min, uh, kullum, uh, they are all kullum in indi rabbina, that we believe in them. They are the mutashabihat, they are non specific, they are doubtful, they are confusing, we do not understand and comprehend them. But since they have been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe in them. And that is all. They do not behave in any crooked manner or any negative manner. And instead, they relate with the muhkimat and they have a clear cut, straight forward behavior and mannerism while they are relating with Quran. So they gain what? They gain knowledge and they gain, they gain guidance from Quran. So we relate that to be from one of the knowledgeable ones, to be from one of those who gain guidance with Quran, we need to relate with what? We need to relate with the muhkimat versus the clear-cut verses of Quran. And we need to behave in a manner, we need to behave in a clear-cut, straightforward manner without any form of crookedness in our manner and our relationship with the verses of Quran. <clears throat> And these knowledgeable people who have a straightforward relationship with the Quran, they supplicate and they say what? Rabbi habli milladunka. They say that our Lord, let not our hearts deviate. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana ba'da is hadaytana wa hablana milladunka rahma innaka antal wahab. They say our Lord, let not our hearts deviate after you have guided us and grant us from yourself mercy. Indeed, you are the bestower. <clears throat> so their supplication is what we made in the end of our sessions. And that is why they make their supplication. The reason why they make their supplication is that our Lord, surely you will gather the people for a day about which there is no doubt. Indeed, Allah does not fail in his promise. So out of fear of her hereafter and out of making preparations for their eternal abode, they make supplications to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prevent their heart from any form of crookedness and any form of deviation from the true teachings of the Quran. Indeed, those who disbelieve, never will their wealth or their children avail them against Allah at all. It is they who are the fuel for fire. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum, Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Theirs is like the custom of the people of Pharaoh and those before them, they denied our signs. So Allah sees them for their sins and Allah is severe in penalty. Verse number 12, say to those who disbelieve, you will be overcome and gathered together to hell and wretched is the resting place. Allahumma ajirna minan nar, Allahumma ajirna minan nar, Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Prophet Wasallam has promised all of us that the person who seeks, who supplicates for release from the hellfire, then the hellfire itself intercedes for the person. Verse number 13, already there has been for you a sign in the two armies which met. Which two armies? The armies of the Muslims and the armies of the Quraysh of Makkah when uh, during the battle of Badr, the two armies which met, one fighting in the cause of Allah, was the strength of what? A strength of 313 mujahideen of Islam who left Medina to confront what? Another of the disbelievers, an army of 1,000 soldiers under the, under the leadership of whom Abu Jahl marching from, uh, Madi, uh, ma uh, marching from Makkah towards Medina. They saw them to be twice their own number by their eyesight, by Allah supported with his victory, whom he wills. Indeed, in that is a lesson for those of vision. Allah supports whom who obey them, who obey Allah and his prophets, and who stay steadfast in their patience of obedience, and they are reliant on Allah.
Allahumma ja'alni saburun wa ja'alni shakura. Beautified for people is the love of that which they desire of women and sons. Heat up sums of gold and silver, fine branded horses and cattle and tilled lands. That is the enjoyment of worldly life. But Allah has for him the best return. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a list of all the worldly things whose love, whose attraction is deep rooted in the hearts of the human beings, the tempting, the alluring things of the world. Allah has labeled them as hubbush shahawat, the list of all the tempting things. These are the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that Allah has infused. Allah has instinct the desire, the love, and the want of all these things in the human instinct. It is instinctive for human beings to desire them, to want them. So how do we need to behave and how do we need to relate with these tempting things of the world is? Remember that desiring them, having, having supplicating for them, trying to work or to strive or struggle to acquire them, to possess them and to have them or to use them. I repeat again, regarding these tempting things of the worldly life, to desire them, to have a want for them, to supplicate for them, to try to work and uh, to acquire them and to possess and own and keep them or to use them in this worldly life. This is neither is it unlawful nor is it haram or prohibited and it is not even disliked or discouraged. On the contrary, it is totally permissible this all state of affairs regarding these tempting things of the world, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them instinctively attractive for us, then it is totally permissible and it is also allowed. And especially if a person is working and struggling to earn halal and lawful livelihood, this becomes what? This becomes an act of worship. And this is not disliked and it is not unlawful. So what we need to do is, that these are, we need to realize that these are trials of the world and we do not need to walk out of them or we do not need to uh, have a state of abstinence from them and we need do not need to stay away from them. What we need to uh, adopt in our lives is a balanced frame of mind and a balanced behavior is that if we need to if we need to acquire them we acquire them in a lawful manner uh, abstaining and refraining from all forms of unlawful and uh, unlawful and haram methods and similarly we can we can use them but we need to use them within the limits of Allah and within the limits of uh, ordained by the Quran and then we need to spend them in the path of Allah in the for the sake of Allah to make them what to make them a bakiyat swalihat for all of us <clears throat> say shall i inform you of something better than that that what for all the worldly riches for those who fear Allah will be gardens in the presence of their Lord beneath which rivers flow wherein they will abide eternally and purified spouses and approval from Allah and Allah is seeing of his servants. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the bounties and blessings of Jannah for all those who do what? <coughs> who are the God-fearing servants of Allah. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wa tuka wa al-arfafa wa al-ghina. Those who say, our Lord, indeed we have believed, so forgive us our sins and protect us from the punishments of fire. So the bounties and blessings of Jannah for previous verse number 15 have been mentioned for the God-fearing and in this verse have been mentioned for those who are repentant and seek forgiveness from Allah. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatwakhireen. Rabbi ghfir wa arham wa anta khayru rahimeen. Allahumma ghfir lana walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat. Rabbana zulamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasireen.
the patient, the true, the obedient, those who spent in the way of Allah and those who seek forgiveness before dawn. Allah witnesses, there is no deity except him, and so do the angels and those of knowledge that he is maintaining creation in justice. There is no deity except him, the exalted in might, the wise. Verse number 19, indeed, the religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. Allah says, Islam, and those who were given the scriptures did not differ except after knowledge had come to them out of jealous enormity between themselves. And whoever disbelieves in the verses of Allah, then indeed Allah is swift in taking account. Allahumma hasibna hisabi yasira. Allah clearly and in a clear cut verse of Surah Al Imran has announced in the in the Lahil Islam. What do we mean? That Allah says that there is no religion accepted in the sight of Allah other than the religion of Islam. What do we mean by deen? Deen or religion means it is, it does not just mean a few rituals. Deen and religion means a complete code of life a complete code of life, a complete mode of ethics. So the only acceptable code of life and the only acceptable mode of ethics in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment for all the bondsmen will be what a life spent according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith, according to the teachings of Islam. And Allah has clearly announced in a verse, On the day of judgment, the only code of life acceptable from the bondsman will be that which has been explained by Allah Almighty as Islam. Any deeds, <clears throat> any deeds, any activities, any style of life, however successful it might seem in the worldly life, however attractive or however impressive it might be in this worldly life, but any lifestyle, any mode of life, any code of ethics, any deeds which are against the code of life explained by Quran and Hadith and the religion of Islam, they will be rejected and discarded. They will be disregarded and not accepted on the day of judgment. So if they argue with you, say, I have submitted myself to Allah in Islam, and so have those who follow me, and say to those who were given the scripture and to the unlearned, have you submitted yourself? And if they submit in Islam, they are rightly guided. But if they turn away, then upon you is only the duty of notification. And Allah is seeing of his servants. So this is what Allah demands in Islam, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires. The words explain what Islam demands of the Muslims and what Allah desires from his bondsmen is submission. It's submission and total surrendering for the will of Allah, for the player of Allah, surrendering from what? Surrendering from all the desires, from all our wills and wants and requirements to be what? To be obedient and submissive servants of Allah. Those who disbelieve in the signs of Allah and kill the prophets without right and kill those who order justice from among the people, give them tidings of a painful punishment. The people of Bani Israel, they used to kill their prophets and the punishment for them, the painful punishment for them is being mentioned in this verse. Like they killed Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam, they killed Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam, Hazrat Yarmiya alayhi salam, these, these prophets and messengers of Allah, they, they were killed and they were assassinated by the people of Bani Israel. And moreover, not only this, they attempted they attempted the killing of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam 
but trying to throw him in the fire. They, uh, as is mentioned in Surah Mumin, that Fir'aun, he planned to kill Hazrat Musa and uh, the Christians, they, the people in the period of Hazrat Isa salam, they planned to crucify him. And last but not the least, Prophet Sallallahu against him, there was 17 assassination attempts planned against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked that who, which group of people or who will suffer the greatest punishment on the day of judgment? And he answered that all those who killed the prophets and killed those who, who were who were working to order justice from among the people, that is, they were who? They were the followers and the heirs and the vices to the prophets, that they were the people who had taken up the mission of preaching and teaching and implementation of Islam as missions of their life. They are the ones whose deeds have become worthless in this world and hereafter, and for them there will be no helpers. Do you not consider those who were given a portion of the scripture? They are invited to the scripture of Allah, that it should uh, uh, arbitrate between them. Then a party of them turns away, and they are refusing." That is because they say, never will the fire touch us except for a few numbered days. And because they were deluded in their religion by what they were inventing. So in this verse number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a false claim, some wrong beliefs and delusions of the people of the book. Allah uh, mentions very frequently in Quran that they used to say that fire will not touch us except for a few numbered days. And which numbered days uh, did they mention? The Jews said that they used to say that for the 40 days we worship the golden calf, we will be just given the punishment of hellfire. And the Christians, they were even more, they were even more deluded. They used to say that the, the crucifixion which Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was subjected to, this was a source of purification and exemption of all the sins for the whole of the believers and the followers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And this crucifixion of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam itself was an atonement for the sins of all the followers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And they also used to say, Nahnu abna Allah, that we are the sons of Allah, Nahnu ahibahu, that we are the beloveds of Allah. And so assuming these all false assumptions, they had invented that they will not be put in the hellfire. So Allah says, so how will it be when we assemble them for a day about which there is no doubt and each soul will be compensate, com compensated in full for what it earned and they will not be wrong. Say, O oh Allah, owner of sovereignty, you give sovereignty to whom you will and you take sovereignty away from whom you will, your honor to whom you will, you humble whom you will, in your hand is all good. Indeed, you are over all things competent. You cause the night to enter the day. You cause the day to enter the night. You bring the living out of the dead and you bring the dead out of the living and you give provisions to whom you will without account. So beautifully explained powers and attributes of and the authority of Allah Almighty. Let not believers take disbelievers as allies rather than believers, and whoever a few does that has nothing with Allah except when taking precaution against them in prudence, and Allah warns you of himself, and to Allah is the final destination. So here in this verse, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us about our social dealings and human relationships and interactions. <coughs> Allah is addressing all the believers not to take the disbelievers as allies. 
So now we have to understand and relate that with whom, with whom, how, what, where can we and should we relate, behave, and interact. And this is what we are learning from this verse. To comprehend all this, that how do we have to go about our social dealings and with our human dealings, we need to understand the basic human dealings are of four types. Four types of human dealings and relationships do we come across while we are socially interacting with people. The first type of human dealing is dealings of the simple interactions, like in our our day-to-day -day life, we come across people around us with whom we interact and we deal in a minimal form, like we go to a marketplace and there we deal with the green grocer or the person who is selling the fruit, or we go up to we go out to pick up our child from the school and we relate with a mother of another child. So with all these people, we have nothing in common. We don't have any bond of relationship. We don't have anything in common, no sharing, no acquaintance, and we might not just even come across again. So this is the most non-reactive and the most simplest forms of interactions. The second form of dealing we come across in our social life is a dealing of hospitality. That is like when a person comes across, when a person comes to our house, we do what? We, out of sheer politeness and courtesy, we extend our hospitality. So this is the second form of a comparatively more interactive form of human dealing. The third form of dealing we come across is a dealing of care and support. We find a person who is needy, needy of help and support, and we extend our help and support to the person. We find a person is crying and we wipe off the tears and we, we try to console and comfort the person. And we find that a person is sick and we pay a visit to the sick person. This is all thought. This is a dealing of care and support and this is more interactive and this is somehow more intimate also. The fourth form of dealing, which has been labeled as vala, the dealing of vala is a dealing of love, intimacy, closeness, and nearness. Now, I would want to clearly highlight some specifications which would clarify this type of relationship is, that is, what is vala and what is this form of relationship is, that it is a, a deep, heartfelt bond of love and affection. It is a very sincere form of relationship in which there is a deep heartfelt bond of love and affection. It is a near and a dear bond. We confide with each other. We share our secrets with each other. And the two people, they will be counseling with each other, taking each other's advice regarding certain matters in their life. And then there will be they will be copying, they will be following each other, they will be idolizing each other and copying each other, and then there will be a sharing of uh, the entertainments and enjoyments as well. So this form of relationship has been, is a relationship of mutual love. The near and the dear ones, they, this is the relationship mentioned in Quran as well. Now, having understood all these four forms of human and social relations and dealings, next we need to understand that how we believers, we are supposed to interact in all these four forms. Now, remember, the first four forms of human relationships, the first, the first three forms of human relationships, that is the relationships of simple interaction, of hospitality, or the relationships of care and support. It is not for the believers. It is not for all of us that we can. I'm not saying that we can, but it is that we should. It is not that we can, but it is that we should. With all these three forms, we should behave with a good conduct, with a good manner, 
with the polite behavior, with the kind attitude, with all these three forms, with all the religions, with all the sects, with all the nations, whether they are believers, whether they are non-believers, whether they are Muslims, non-Muslims, they are obedience, they are transgressors. In any form, the first three forms of human relationships, the Muslims should behave in a perfect conduct, manner, behavior, kindness of attitude in all the relationships. And the purpose why is the first three forms of relationships have to be adopted with Muslims in this perfect conduct with all the human beings is why. The first purpose is that Muslims, as Muslims, we need to learn knowledge, skill, trade to be able to prosper. So we need to relate with, with all the people of the world. The second thing is that we will have to trade. We will have to make business dealings with people. And this will be what? This will be a source of livelihood for the Muslims. Because if we do not do all that, then Muslims will tend to stay behind. They will tend to lag behind the race of progress and development. And we would tend to stay underdeveloped and we would stay behind in the race of this life. So to advance and to have progress, we need to relate with the people of all the world in various fields of life. And we need to do that in which manner we need to have the first three forms of relationships with a total good, proper conduct and manner with all the world and internationally. And the second reason why we need to behave with the proper conduct with everyone around us in these three relationships is that the excellent conduct and the proper manner and the behavior of the Muslims with all the non-Muslim world will also be a source of a silent invitation towards Islam. When all the non-Muslims, when they will see the polite and the courteous, the caring manner and the conduct of the Muslims, they will be obviously attracted towards Islam. So this will be a silent method of inviting people towards Islam. But remember the last form of human relationship, the relationship of a wala, which I have explained as the most intimate relationship between the two people. This last form of human dealing, Quran gives a very clear cut instructions that this has not to be Muslims. All the Muslims, they are not permitted to take as a wala who all the non-believers and the disbelievers, the non-Muslims, this is what we are being guided in this verse number 28, that all the Muslims and all the believers, they it is not permitted for them. It is not lawful for them that they take the disbelievers and the non-Muslims in a relationship of Allah. And then as we proceed in the next surahs of Quran, we will learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also instruct us and order and enjoin the Muslims not to take the people of the book also for their wala. The Jews and the Muslims also, we, we do not have to, we have to refrain from making a relationship of wala with even the Jews and the Christians. And then finally, in Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also ask the Muslims to avoid relationship of wala with even, with even the brothers or the fathers if they prefer disobedience over obedience of Allah. That is, if the fathers and the brothers also prefer to stay in a state of disobedience to Allah, then the Muslims and the believers will be kind to them, will be supportive and caring to them, will be polite and merciful to them, and will extend their hospitality to them, no doubt. But there will be no relationship of wala with such a father and such a brother also. So this is what we, and not even with hypocrites or with the disobedience or the transgressors, will the Muslims have a relationship of wala. What? Why is this so? The reason is that if a believer, if a believer, if a Muslim starts following, copying, idolizing, or sharing secrets or taking advices from a hypocrite or from a disobedient person or from a transgressor, 
then what will happen is that obviously his model will be of uh, his his model will be of disobedience and transgression his advice will be of disobedience and transgression and this will lead to what this will weaken this will weaken the faith and will damage their belief that is why in clear cut orders a believer is supposed to avoid this form of relationship with nobody other than people of strong faith and strong belief wala will only be permitted for the believers with the believing obedient muslims of and servants of allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand all the concepts of uh, relationships with the human beings around us and accept and obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 29, say whether you conceal what is in your breast or reveal it, Allah knows it and he knows that which is in the heavens and that which is on the earth and Allah is over all things competent. So here from this verse, what we realize is that Allah knows what Allah is all knowing. He is all seeing and hearing and not only does he know what we know we reveal he knows also what we conceal so the importance of realizing this is that it is not only our our, our external and our outwardly appearance that we need to make it according to the teachings of quran but we also need to do what what we conceal what we have hidden our secret personalities and our inner self also we need to reform our our hearts our souls we need to purify from within also as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported in a tradition he said that there is a piece in the body there is a part of the body that if it stays pure the whole body stays pure and if it is spoiled the whole of the body is spoiled remember be aware the part of the body is the heart this is the part of the body for which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was pointing towards it and he was saying taqwa ha huna taqwa ha huna taqwa ha huna this is heart it is the soul where the piety resides the way the piety resides allahumma aati nafsi taqwa ha allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shurur anfusina the day every soul will find what it has done of good present before it and what it has done of evil it will wish that between itself and that evil was a great distance and allah warns you of himself and allah is kind to his servants say if you should love allah then follow me so allah will love you and forgive you your sins and allah is forgiving and merciful so here in this verse number 31 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining and narrating a method to purify the souls allah says that if all of you believers oh believers if you claim if you announce if you declare that you love allah then to prove the truth of your claim the truth of your declaration you have to do what you have to follow you have to copy idealize and glamorize his beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how can you truly love allah how can you truly love allah if you don't love and follow his beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then allah promises the rewards for following a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the two rewards are allah says qul in kuntum tuhibbun allah fattabi'uni that if you love allah then follow copy idealize glamorize the sunnahs of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the teachings of hadith of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then when you do these that you start obeying the messages of hadith and you start following the sunnah of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what two rewards will you get yuhibbukumullah allah he himself will start loving you if you obey and follow the sunnahs and teachings of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah's beloved then 
you will come up within the list of those who are the beloveds of Allah. And the second reward is, He will forgive your sins. He will forgive your sins. What else can we all desire? What else can we all want to be included in the list of those who are the beloveds of Allah and to be forgiven all the sins? And this this all, these two rewards and these all two rewards of Allah, we can achieve how? By following the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is why we keep on urging and we, can't, we keep on insisting to all the believers to follow, to follow the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, there are crooked minded people the so-called intellectuals with a crooked mind, they generally raise the accusation and they generally oppose and they generally criticize that it is all those people who are preaching and teaching. They keep on inviting people towards these small sunnahs, na'uzubillah, na'uzubillah, minzalik, these petty small sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu After all, what difference does it make? They are critical enough, Na'uzubillah, to say, they have the audacity to say that what difference does it make? That which, which shoe do I wear first? And which pair of socks do I take off first? And which, which shirt, which side of the shirt do I insert my arm first? And which, which arm do I take out first? And which part of the head do I comb first? And how do I eat? And how do I walk? And what do I say when I climb the stairs? What, what difference does it make? You know, this, this verse tells us which, what difference does it make? This verse explains what difference does it make when we follow the sunnah. A person following the sunnah becomes a beloved of Allah. And a person following the sunnah in any action, in any deed, Will all the sins be forgiven? And you know what? There's another thing which I would want to explain regarding the following of Sunnah and regarding the idolizing and glamorizing of Prophet Sallallahu is, remember that during the daytime when we are up and we are doing something, if we do it out of our own way and the way we want to and the way we adopt, only and only that task and the job will be done. But if we, if we do that work, or we carry on this activity according to the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu the way Prophet Sallallahu used to do that activity, then doing that piece of work and carry on, carrying on that activity will be what? Will be an act of worship. And this activity will be rewarded as a good deed, will be recorded as a righteous deed in our records of these and it will be it will be added in the weights of the good deeds on the day of judgment like if we are drinking from a glass of water and we drink it the way we want to only what will happen is that we will drink and we will quench our thirst and that is it that is all what we will gain out of it but if we drink water as per the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu we sit down and we don't breathe inside the glass and we take it, we drink it in forms of three sips, stopping in between. Then we are drinking this water out of the glass according to the Sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu This drinking of water will also be an act of worship. It will be, it will be a source of reward of good deeds and this will this will make us be one of the beloveds of Allah. And this will make us, this will be a source of a source of forgiveness of our sins. So why is it not a good deal to adopt the sunnahs of Prophet? It's not going to hurt us. It is not going to make us do something extra. We have to do all these activities in our life in any case. We are, we are from morning to evening, we are carrying on all these activities in any case. But if we carry on all the activities of our life from morn to evening, according to the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu they will be what? They will be rewarded. They will be good deeds for all of us. So this is a very easy deal for all of us to convert the whole of our life activities from morning till evening into acts of worship.
That is why, that is why I will always urge all of you to adopt the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu life so that our life can become a complete act of worship from morning till evening. And not only for ourselves, we need to teach all these little sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu daily life activities to our children also. Because, you know, to these little ones, a child three to four years of age, obviously what else about religion, what else about Islam are we going to teach the little child, the little mind? We, we are at this state of his life. We are obviously not going to teach him about the laws of Allah or about the concepts of gambling or intoxicants. We are not going to teach him about the concepts of debt and will in Islam. No. The max possible we can teach him or introduce him to is the sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu in his in his small little life, in his little heart, in his little mind, infusing the love of Prophet Sallallahu by introducing him to these sunnahs of life, sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu life. When he's entering the washroom, the mother just holds the hand and says, no, no, my son, just put this foot first. Why, mommy? Because Prophet Sallallahu told us to do this. He did it like this. When he starts eating, I hold the hand and tell, no, Sonny, just, just recite Bismillah. Why, mommy? Because Prophet ﷺ used to do it this way. So this will be introducing Prophet ﷺ to him. It will be infusing the love of Prophet ﷺ to him. And you know what? Another thing is, it will be just like teaching a kindergarten child, like a kindergarten child, a child in Montessori, we teach them one, two, three, basic counting. And we, we see that in no, just, just a few years, in a matter of few years, the person, the child, we had taught one, two, three in the Montessori. Within a few years, the child comes up solving huge sums of trigonometry and complicated complicated questions of logarithms. Similarly, in a Montessori class or in a preschool class, we are teaching what? We're just teaching A, B, C. And then in a few years, the child is one who is capable of reading complicated comprehensions and answering them. So this is it. We get the child used to small sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu day-to-day life. And inshallah, when the ch child will be a mature adult Muslims, it will be very easy for him to adopt the, the greater sunnahs of Prophet Sallallahu also. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Say, obey Allah and the messenger, but if they turn away, then indeed Allah does not like the disbelievers. Indeed, Allah chose Adam alayhi salam and Nu alayhi salam and the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the family of Imran over the worlds. So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse 33, from here, will start the second part of the chapter or of the of Surah Al-Imran. These verses from starting from verse number 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed uh, in the ninth year after the immigration of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Mecca to Medina, that is in ninth AH, were these verses of Surah Al-Imran, they were revealed and when there was a group of uh, the religious leaders of Christians, and they were the scholars from the, from the people of Nijran, they came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this was in 19 AH. And they came over to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to find out about his religion. And they asked Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as to what did the verses of Quran, they have to say about Hazrat Isa Alaihi Wasallam and Hazrat Maryam Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, all these verses, in response to their question, to the, the question of the religious leaders and the scholars from the people of Nijran, uh, they had come as a group and uh, as uh, an answer to the question of the deposition from Nijran, these verses of Surah Al-Imran were revealed and these were then recited by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the deposition of Nijran, answering them their questions. 
Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next few verses, is uh, relating the events of a chosen family, the chosen family of Ali Imran. For all of us, if we want to be among the chosen people, we, need, we will go through the verses and we will realize that whom Allah chooses, whom Allah chooses for his rahmah, for his blessings, for his radha, for his pleasure, for his love, for his forgiveness, his mercy, for whom Allah chooses out of his bondsmen. We will read the whole narration and inshallah, we will try to learn, we will try to remember and adopt the traits and the manners of the chosen people. Allah says, descendants, some of them from others, and Allah is hearing and knowing. Verse number 35, mentioned when the wife of Imran, Imra Atu Imran, she said, who do, uh, who do we mean by Imra Atu Imran, the lady or the wife of Imran, it means whom? It is, it is referring to the mother of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam because we learn by tradition that Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's father's name was Imran. So that is why her mother has been called as Imra to Imran. The second thing which we find in certain commentaries is that Imra to Imran has been, uh, the mother of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam has been called as Imra to Imran because um, uh, the brother of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Hazrat Harun alayhi salam or their father's name was Imran. So it refers to a lady who was in this family tree. So she said, what? The Imra to Imran, she said, my Lord, indeed, I have pledged to you what is in my womb, consecrated for your service. So accept this from me. Indeed, you are the hearing and knowing. So this lady in this family, she and she and her progeny was among the chosen. And why did Allah choose her? We will gather the points from the narration of this verse is that Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's mother, she would conceive repeatedly, but every time she conceived, she the pregnancy would not go to full term and she would repeatedly abort. Then finally, she made this solemn pledge of sacrificing the child and with full sincerity and devotion, she, she presented and she sacrificed the child she had conceived that she will give away her child. She will give away her child and specify the child for the service of Allah Almighty and for the service of Deen and for the service of Islam. So Allah chose, so Allah chose her. Allah chooses whom? Allah chooses all those who sacrifice their beloved things, who sacrifice their beloved ones for the cause and for the sake of Allah, for the sake of spreading and preaching the messages of Allah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. But when she delivered her, she said, my Lord, I have delivered a female. Because you know that she had uh, made the solemn pledge that she will sacrifice, she will free the child from all the worldly, uh, from all the worldly services and all the worldly activities and specify and devote the child for the service of the religion of Allah. She had most probably thought that it would be a son and she would make him a preacher and she would, and she would present him as a mujahid of Islam. But when she gave birth to a daughter, she was slightly upset and anxious because obviously, as she said, that a daughter is not like a son. She said, my Lord, I have delivered a female and Allah was most knowing of what she had delivered and male is not like a female. So, so initially she had a few reservations and she had a few um, concerns and she was slightly upset. But then she said, what? And I have named her as Maryam and I seek refuge for her in you and for her descendants from Trayatan, the expelled from the mercy of Allah. So initially she had a bit, a few reservations and she was slightly constrained because obviously she said that a daughter cannot be like a son. A woman is obviously, it is difficult for her to perform all these services and activities. But in any case, she named her Maryam. 
this name itself itself shows that despite her concern for it being a baby girl she fulfilled her pledge she fulfilled her pledge because the name mariam it means what it means the one who serves the one who serves allah the one who serves and worships the religion so the name itself meant that she fulfilled her pledge and she fulfilled the oath she had taken for the service of her child and then she supplicated inni u'izuha bika wa zurriyatiha min ash-shaytani ar-rajim regarding this part of the verse we learn from a tradition of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that uh, he has informed all of us that when a baby is born that whenever a baby is born the shaitan pinches the newborn baby and it is because of this that the baby cries and the baby howls but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that only two babies they were protected from this act of shaitan one was hazrat isa alaihi salam and hazrat maryam alaihi salam and this was because of the dua the supplication their mother had made so these <coughs> we need to remember this verse in the orizuha bika wa zurriyatiha min ash-shaytani ar-rajim which saved hazrat isa alaihi salam and hazrat maryam alaihi salam from the from the shaitan and from the act of shaitan they were saved and they were in the protection of allah so when do we need to recite it whenever a woman delivers a baby or whenever we are around our daughters or our sisters having at the time of a delivery we need to remember this verse of surah al imran the verse this part of the verse number 36 of uh, of surah al imran and we need to recite it ourselves or we need to recite when we are around the time of delivery of our sisters and daughters or daughter in laws and we also need to uh, pass on this information to all our muslim sisters <coughs> so her lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner and put her in care of zakaria every time zakaria entered her upon her in the prayer chamber he found with her provisions he said o maryam from where is this coming to you she said it is from allah indeed allah provides for whom he wills without any account so from here in this verse we learn that when um, the mother a mother of hazrat maryam alayhi salam she presented her daughter for the cause of the preaching and teaching of islam and for the service of islam she was uh, made to stay and reside in hekle salimani of baitul maqdis and there she was uh, she stayed there for the purpose of learning of the messages of allah for the purpose of teaching and preaching of islam in future now what happened there now what happened there this is what is important to relate for all of us because you know today today parents they have inhibitions to connect their children with quran mothers they have inhibitions and they have reservations to connect their daughters with quran with the with the learning of quran and with the teachings of quran and the main mainly the points are the fear which the parents and the mothers have regarding connection connecting their do- daughters and children with the study of quran with the learning of quran the fear is generally the social factors the social factors the first being that they think that when they will connect their daughter or their child with quran the child or the daughter will become a fanatic the child would turn into an orthodox muslim and they might end up as a social misfit individuals they might turn out to be social outcasts or social misfits they might come out to be the second fear is generally that for example if a daughter the mothers they assume that if a daughter reads the quran and 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 studies the quran and starts adopting the quran then the daughter once she starts adopting the islamic dress code she might she might face issues regarding regarding her marriage she might start facing issues while finding an appropriate match in the society the third problem with generally people think is that if a daughter she starts reading the quran and she starts 
uh, learning the Quran, she will get deprived of the worldly education and she will not have any professional education. Once she does not have a worldly professional education, she will suffer from economic crises in her life. So let's just see that when the mother of Hazrat Maryam salam, she presented her daughter Hazrat Maryam for the service of Islam, for the learning of the messages of Allah and the commandments of Allah, what did happen? Did anything of this sort happen in this case? What happened? Allah says, so Lord accepted her. Her Lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner. So did she become a misfit? She, did she become a social outcast? No, Allah accepted her and Allah caused her to grow in a good manner as a pious, as a righteous individual. She was not a social misfit. She was not a social outcast. Now, what about her provisions? What about her provisions? Did she suffer from economic crisis? And who took care of her? Did she not find anybody to protect her, to take care of her? Allah said, and Allah put her in the care of Zakaria. And how did Allah, did she face an economic crisis? Did she run short of any form of provisions? Where did her provisions come from? Zakaria al-Islam, when he used to enter upon her prayer chamber, he used to find with her provisions. And where were these provisions from? We learn from traditions that Zakaria alayhi salam, he used to see that there were fruits with her and there were provisions of fruits with her which, are, which were not seasonal. Out of season fruits were coming from where they were being sent to her from heaven. These were the fruits of Jannah. These were being sent to her from heavens by whom? Who was the sustainer? Who was the provider? This is the message of the verses. This is the message of this all story. Allah help us have faith. Allah help us have strong belief. Allah help us develop reliance and patience. Allah help us develop the fear of hereafter and be help us be all of those who present who present the best of our time, the best of our age, the best of our skills and knowledge and offsprings for the sake of service of Allah. Rabbana taqabbal minna and Allah when we present our time our energy, our wealth, our, our houses, our children, our knowledge, our skills for the sake of service of Allah in the path of Allah, for the teaching, for the preaching, for the missions of Dava, when we present all this, Allah accept it from us. Allah choose us for all this service of Islam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. And at that, Zakaria salam called upon his Lord saying, my Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. He said, Rabbi habli min ladunka zurriyatan tuayyibatan inna ka dua. My Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. Indeed, you are the hearer of supplications. Now, Hazrat Zakaria salam he he was he was experiencing what he saw such a pious such a pious worshiping maiden young girl and that she was being blessed by by the by the miraculous fruits from heavens and there he was has a zakaria he was old and his wife had been infertile. But seeing all these miracles and seeing this pious child, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's mother, he had blessed Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam's mother, a pious daughter, a righteous daughter, when she had asked for, when she had supplicated to Allah, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was being kind and merciful to bless Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam with these miracle fruits. So there he was. He developed reliance, he developed faith, he developed, he developed belief in Allah, in the powers, in the authorities, in the sovereignty of Allah, and there he supplicated. There he supplicated with these words, Rabbi habli min ladunka zurriyatan toyibatan inna kasamiyud dua. These words that you are the hearer of supplication was his manner. 
Now, when he supplicated in these words with reliance, how, where, and how was he answered? He was answered how? So the angel called to him while he was standing in the prayer chamber. Indeed, Allah gives you the good tidings of Yahya confirming a word from Allah and who will be honorable, abstaining from women and a prophet from among the righteous. So the dua, it reached the throne of Almighty Allah. This supplication was heard. It was accepted. It was granted with the grace of Allah. How was it granted? He was given the good news. He was given the good news, not only the good news of, the, of, a, of a conception, but he was given the good news of the birth of a son. Even the name of the son, Yahya, was suggested in the good news. And it was told that this name has never been suggested for anyone before Hazrat Yahya, his son. He was also given the good news that his son, Suggested as the name of Yahya, he will be a prophet of Allah. And he was also good, given the good news of all the good traits of his son also. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. How was this supplication accepted? In what merciful manner and what manner of blessing of Allah was this supplication of Hazrat Yahya accepted? So what do we learn from here? That the supplications we are going to make in future are going to be the supplications suggested in Quran and the supplications of prophets mentioned in Quran. So what advantage will we gain when we supplicate in the words of the supplications of prophets or in the words of the supplications of Quran? Number one will be that we will be rewarded while supplicating. We will be rewarded we will be rewarded with the recitation of Quran and we will be rewarded because of following of the sunnah of a prophet. And moreover, these supplications, they are tried supplications. These are the supplications which have reached the throne of Allah. These are tried and accepted supplications. So we need to use these for our supplications. And moreover, these supplications, when we start using these words of supplications, these are comprehensive and these are complete as contrast to the supplication, incomplete supplications we generally tend to make. These are comprehensive and they are complete. And they are also those which will teach us how to, the manner and the comprehension of how to supplicate. We will also learn while we start adopting these words for our supplications. Now, why was this supplication answered? The first reason is, what, what was the manner of Hazrat Zakriya salam? He was saying, And he was saying, he was saying that I will always, I've always been heard. So this was reliance. This was reliance. And this was relying. And this was understanding and comprehending and believing in the power, in the authority, and in the control and the sovereignty of Allah. So when we supplicate to Allah with a sure mind, with reliance, realizing and mentioning the attributes of Allah, inshallah, those supplications will be heard and will be granted. So we can, we can supplicate with this supplication, we can use this supplication when we want, we are desirous for having our own offsprings. When we are wanting to have our own offsprings or when we are uh, wanting to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for grandchildren, for children or for grandchildren, or we want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that make for, for the reformation of our children as pious and righteous children, even then we can we can use these words of uh, these words of the supplication. And when we want to find uh, we want to find a spouse for our children, a righteous and a pious match for our children. Also, we can use the words of this supplication. Verse number 41, he said, my Lord, make for me a sign. He said, your sign is that you will not be able to speak to the people for three days except by gestures. And remember your Lord much and exalt him with praise in the evening and morning. 
So you know when the angel came and gave the good news of the birth of Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam, explaining and narrating all the attributes and his prophethood also, then immediately Hazrat, Yah Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam, he said, my Lord, make me make for me a sign. Because you know, the level of the faith does not stay the same always. He, when he was observing Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, and he was experiencing, he was seeing all the miraculous fruits, then the level of faith and belief was at the height. And he was in an ultimate state of reliance. And he, that is why he supplicated. But immediately at a later stage, the faith slightly decreased. And there he was asking that make for me a sign. And then the angel replied, and the angel replied that the sign would be Two things would we understand from the verse was he ordered by Allah. The first thing which has been explained in the commentary is that he will not be able to speak or he should not speak. So first is that Allah ordered him that you should not speak to people for three days. That is, he was asked to have a fast of silence, which was a method of fasting in the people of Bani Israel. So Allah ordered him that when you have, when, the, when your wife uh, has conceived and when you've got this news of uh, the, the birth of your son, this as a gratitude to show the gratitude for receiving this good news, you need to do what? you need to worship Allah by having a fast of silence and even while you are in a state of silence during the fast keep on doing what glorifying Allah remembering Allah exalting Allah while you are fasting and the second uh, which has been explained the second meaning which has been explained in certain commentaries is that Allah told us that the Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam, that the sign of the pregnancy or the conception will be that when the when the wife will hold the conception, Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam's speech will be withheld and suspended for three days. That is, as a sign of conception, three days he will not be able to speak. But despite the fact that he will not be able to speak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him that when he will have this sign of failure to be able to speak, then to show his gratitude for conception and showing Allah the gratitude for the blessing of this pregnancy, he should remember Allah by glorifying him, exalting him, and by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we learn is that when what Quran teaches us, that when we are blessed, by a blessing and a bounty of Allah, we need to do what? We need to worship him. We need to praise him. We need to glorify him. And the method of expressing the gratitude to Allah is glorifying and exalting Allah. That is exactly what Prophet Wasallam has been taught and instructed in Surah Nasr also, where Allah mentioned about the conquest of Makkah. And the victory of, from, of the Muslims, he said, That Prophet, ﷺ, when you come out with the spectacular victory of the conquest of Makkah, you do what? You just do not rejoice. You do what? You praise Allah, you glorify Allah. So, this is a method of expressing verbal gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mention when the angel said, O Maryam alayhi salam, indeed Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the women of the world. And O Maryam, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow with those who bow in the prayers. So now when Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam was chosen, she was chosen for what? She has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angel said and called out to Maryam alayhi salam that she was among the chosen people, chosen among the whole of the worlds. How was she chosen has been explained in a tradition of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam that he said that five women were perfect. Five women were perfect. And he said, Hazrat Asiya, the wife of Iran, Hazrat Maryam, the mother of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Hazrat Khadija, the first wife of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 
and then he said hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and hazrat fatima bint muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so in some traditions we learn the name of four women other than hazrat khadija hazrat fatima and in other tradition in the four we learn the name of hazrat uh, aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha so this makes a list of five perfected women in one, uh, one of them is whom hazrat maryam alayhi salam so allah chose hazrat maryam alayhi salam and when he chose hazrat maryam alayhi salam what did she what was she expected to do and what was she enjoined to do number one we need to understand all this because when we need to realize this that when allah chooses the muslim women what are they supposed to and expected to do do you know of any chosen women do you know of any muslim women who have been chosen yes alhamdulillah by the grace of allah by the blessings and mercy of allah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen all of us has chosen all of us to go through these sessions of quran to sit and to learn and to listen and to understand and to comprehend the messages of quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us so what we need to learn is that when allah chooses the muslim women what do these chosen muslim women have to do the first thing is purify yourself purify yourself because we know at tahuru shatr al iman purification is half of faith and half of iman and we know in allah yuhibb at tawwabin wa yuhibb al mutatawakhirin those who purify allah loves them they are in the list of the beloved people of allah so if allah chooses muslim women they need to purify themselves they need to purify their bodies by their wudu by their bath of purification and they need to purify their dresses their garments from all forms of physical filth or impurities and they need to purify their clothes their garments from all forms of arrogance from wastefulness from extravagance from any form of vulgarity immorality or from the resemblance for the resemblance of their dresses and garments with their with the with males and with the non muslims and they need to purify their garments from all form of vulgar manner and they need to purify their dresses and make them what a dress of piety libas so taqwa and all the chosen women they need to keep their language their conversation pure pure and safe and clean from all form of telling of lies and bragging and boasting and showing off an exhibition and demonstration and they need to keep their conversations pure and clean from all forms of back biting and slander and mocking and taunting and hurting and dishonoring and disrespecting those around us and we need to keep our gaze our sights pure and we need to keep our hearts pure from all the filth from all the filth of arrogance of envy of jealousy of mutual grudges and grievances harsh and hard feelings for those around us and we need to purify our hearts and souls from the love of from the love of the wealth from the love and lust of the world from selfishness from miserliness from hypocrisy we need to keep our our hearts pure from all these things and then the chosen women they need to do what they need to be devoutly obedient to allah so that is what we need to do to stay obedient to allah to surrender to allah to submit to the teachings and the messages of allah and to do what to prostrate to prostrate and to bow down and to establish and to protect and to take care and guard our salah that is from the news of the unseen with which we reveal to you and you were not with them when they cast their pens as to which of them should be responsible for hazrat maryam alayhi salam no were you with them when they they disputed <clears throat> so what is this <clears throat> 
Now, what happened was that when all the people in the time of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, they received the news of her piety, of her, of her modesty, of her righteousness. So what happened was seeing such a pious, such a pious, a righteous maiden who had been presented for the service of the religion of Allah. All the servants of the heckle, all the servants of the heckle, they wanted and they desired to be the caretakers for Maryam alayhi salam. Now, they having this desire of uh, taking up the responsibility of the caretaker of Maryam alayhi salam, they proposed impossible suggestions for choosing the caretaker. So they, they made a suggestion that they will all drop their pens in the flowing streams and who, whoever's pen will flow against the flow of the stream. Then that person will be chosen as the kafil, as the caretaker of the guardian of Maryam alayhi salam. So what happened was they planned makaru wa makarullah. They planned that they could be chosen and they planned that Zakaria alayhi salam could be deprived. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans what he plans is the best planning. And whatever he plans, he conducts the he conducts the situations and miracles to conduct his miracle, to conduct his planning. So miraculously, miraculously by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pen of uh, Hazrat Zakaria alayhi salam, when it was thrown down in the water, it started flowing against the stream of water. And so by this miraculous happening, by the planning of Allah, Hazrat Zakaria alayhi salam was appointed as the guardian, as the kafil and the caretaker of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And this was, this was the help, the support, the protection of Allah, which was extended for Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. She received the help of Allah and she was extended the care of Hazrat Zakriya alayhi salam. Hazrat Zakriya, he happened to be the maternal uncle to Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And he was also a prophet. And moreover, he was also childless. So by the help of Allah, she happened to receive the love and affection and also the religious training from a prophet Zakriya alayhi salam. This is what? This is the mercy of Allah. This is the love, help, support, guidance and protection of Allah, which Allah extends for whom? For whom? Those who are obedient to him, those who are patient for, for his obedience, those who rely on him, and those who present themselves sincerely for the service of his religion of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us remember all this, help us relate to all this, and help us adopt all this. And when we adopt all this mannerism, Allah protect us, Allah help us, Allah support us, Allah guide us for all that is the best. And then Allah accept from us our deeds and our, our services, which we do extend to a minimal extent for the service of Islam. Verse number 45, and mention when the angel said, O Maryam alayhi salam, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him whose names will be, will, whose name will be Masih, Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, distinguished in this world and hereafter and among those brought near to Allah. So here in this verse, after the whole narration, now is the part of the birth of Hazrat, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. The angel gave the news and the tidings of the birth as Kalimatullah. Kalimatullah means Hazrat Isa alayhi salam because the birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was with a miracle. The birth was without miraculously without a father with a, with a kalima with a word of kun, fayakun. So this was the kalima, the word of kun from Allah was the mir miracle kalima. And that is why Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has been called as kalimatullah in Quran and also even in Injil. And here he, his name has been mentioned as Masih. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has been called as Masih in Quranic verses. And it means, it refers to, the first meaning is, Masih means a person who travels. Sayah, 
the Masi is the person who travels. He has been called by this name because he used to travel all around to preach and to teach the verses revealed to him. And Masi is also from Mim Sin Ha. Masaha means to rub. And he used to rub his hand. He was given the miracle by Allah that he used to rub his hands and he used to cure the congenital blind and he used to cure the lepers. And then he used to rub his hand on the dead and they used to be they used to be raised and given life by the order of Allah. So these miracles of rubbing, because of that, he was called as Masih. And another thing of rubbing was that the people of Bani Israel, they, to give him respect and regard, it was their custom that if they had to give respect and regard to a person, they would, they would make him have a seat and they used to rub or massage oil in his hair. So to give respect or regard to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, uh, because he was, uh, he memorized, he had in his memory all of the Torah. So to give respect and regard to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they used to massage oil and rub oil in his hair. And that is why also he was known as Masih. And then he has been called as Isa ibn Maryam. This is also many times in Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him ibn Maryam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam. This means what? This actually, the calling of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam by the name of Ibn Maryam, the son of Maryam, means what? This proves the miraculous birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam being without a father. The without father miraculous birth of Quran of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has been proven when he is being called as Ibn Maryam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has enjoined upon all the believers that they should be called by the name of these fathers. As is said in a verse of Quran, that you call your children by addressing them by the name of their fathers. So if there had been a father to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, he would have been called by the name of his fathers, by the orders of Allah. Now, since he did not have a father and he was born as a miracle without a father, he was associated with the name of his mother repeatedly in Quran. He will speak to the people in the cradle and in maturity and will be of the righteous. So these are a few miracles now. In the next verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be mentioning the few miracles which were blessed to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. The first being mentioned here is that he will speak in the cradle. And this was a miracle. This was a miracle, and it has also been proved by hadith also. The Prophet Sallallahu has been reported in a true hadith in, uh, in Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu said that there were three children. There were three children who talked or who spoke in the cradle. One of them was Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. When was this? This was when Hazrat Maryam salam gave birth to a fatherless son. To the fatherless son, Ruhullah, Kalimatullah, Hazrat Isa ibn Maryam. And then she carried the baby back to her people. She had shifted over to Baytullaham for her delivery. And when she came back to her people carrying this baby without a father, without being married, when she came back, obviously there was to be uh, there was to be a roar of allegations and accusations against her, her father, her brother, her mother, and that was expected. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala instructed Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam to stay quiet and not to answer back and to say that she was in a fast of silence. So she exactly obeyed Allah Subhanahu wa Taala despite the fact that it was a very difficult uh, order of Allah to obey. And it seemed like not a practical solution to the condition, but she obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will we will go through all this when we are going through the verses of Surah Maryam, inshallah. And when she obeyed the suggestion which was given to her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the help and the mercy and the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came. And when they were accusing her and when they were coming out with allegations against her, she quietly pointed towards the baby. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously blessed with this baby in her lap, blessed the baby with the power to talk. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam 
told what? Inni Abdullah wa Rasulahu that I am the servant of Allah and I am his prophet. So this was a miracle to save to save the repetition of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps, supports, protects the modest, helps, supports all those who are obedient, patient, and reliant. And the second uh, baby who spoke in the lap of the mother, we relate from the words of Hadith is that there was a woman who had a baby in her lap and she was nursing and feeding the baby. That she saw that a person who was on a horse, a young, youthful, beautiful, smart person, and he was very arrogant and he was riding a white Arabic stallion and was going in, in vanity. She looked at the person and she prayed and she supplicated that Allah make my son like this. Immediately did the baby leave the breast and the baby talked out and said, Allah may do not make me like this. Do not make me like this vain, proud, arrogant person. So then there after some time, a person who was a slave passed in front of that woman. She was still nursing the baby and the person was being beaten, was being beaten up badly by the master and he was being persecuted. And the woman immediately supplicated that Allah do not make my son like this. The baby again left the breast and he, he said, the baby called out that instead Oh Allah, instead of me, if you have to make me like any one of the two, instead of that arrogant person riding on the horse with full pride and vanity, make me like this person. So the baby preferred being a humbled person to being an arrogant person. So this was a person, a baby who, who, who talked in the lap of the mother. And then there was another baby, the story, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi recited the story, uh, narrated the story of Juraj. Juraj was a person, uh, a very pious and a righteous person from the Bani Israel. And he used to worship in his chamber, in his secret private chamber, he used to worship. One day, his mother was uh, was not a believer. And one day when he was uh, making his super erogatory salah in his, in his worship chamber, his mother called out to him. But because he was in a state of salah, he did not answer his mother. And the mother was furious and she was angry. And she made a supplication for her son that he may face or he may come across an adulteress of the town. So according to the supplication of the mother, a few days later, an adulteress came over to him and she invited him to zina or to adultery. But he, because of the fear of Allah, he refused to accept the, uh, the invitation of that immoral woman. And this uh, this made her furious and she went to a shepherd and where she had an illicit relationship for where she conceived and when she gave birth to the baby she she <clears throat> to take her revenge from juraj she labeled that the baby was juraj's baby and when the people found out that he, despite the fact that he used to keep on worshipping and he posed that he was very pious and righteous, he was committing, he was involved in such immoral deeds and he was so immodest to can, uh, to uh, be adultering with such a woman. So they ran to him and they beat him up and they broke his uh, his worship chamber also. When they were doing all this, he was so upset, he was so anxious that he again stood up in Salah and he was making a supererogatory Salah that with the help of Allah, how he helps, he supports, he protects those who are modest, those who are God-fearing and pious, that by the will and order of Allah, that baby, that baby who had been labeled with this, as a son of Juraj, that baby called out and he spoke out the name of his actual father while he was in the mother's lap. And then when the people realized that they had done wrong and they had uh, they had been uh, they had wronged Juraj, they came back and they asked for forgiveness. And they also asked him that if he wants, they would build him, they would build him up a golden chamber for his worship. But never being lustful and never being greedy and never having any form of love for the for the riches and the gold and silver of this wealthy life. He just requested them to make 
to help him reconstruct his uh, prayer chamber. And this was the story of the child, the third child who conversed while he was in the lap of the mother. So Allah says that he will speak with the people in the cradle and also in which? In maturity. So now here in this verse and also many other similar verses of Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam will converse and will talk to people in maturity. But we also learn from the verses of Quran and from the traditions that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, when the people of his, uh, when the people of his period, they had conspirized against him and they had decided to crucify him. Then what happened was by the will and the order of Allah, people had planned to crucify him. Makaru wa makarullah. We will be inshallah getting across, coming across these verses soon in the today's lesson also. They had planned to crucify him by the order and the will of Allah. Allah planned and so raised Hazrat Isa salam, completely with his body and soul to the heavens. And there, from there, he was raised before the age of maturity, that is before the age of 40 years. So now Allah says in Quran that he will converse to people at the age of 40 years. How will that be? The age of Kahulat. The age of Kahulat is more than the age of 40 years. How will that be possible? How would that be possible when he was raised to the heavens before the age? These verses, these verses, similar verses which say that he will converse with people at the age of more than the age of 35 to 40 years, they prove they prove the concept of descent of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam before the day of judgment. This is what these are. This is one of the major signs of resurrection, the descent of Isa alayhi salam. The descent of Isa alayhi salam before the day of resurrection is one of the major signs of resurrections. That is, the descent of Isa alayhi salam will be after the appearance of Hazrat Imam Mahdi and after the appearance of Antichrist or the Jal. And it is these verses which serve as a proof for this truth. She said, my Lord, how will I have a child when no man has touched me? The angel said, such is Allah. He creates what he wills. When he decrees a matter, he only says to it, kun fayakun, be and it is. <coughs> Verse number 48, and he will, who? Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, when she was being given the news of his birth, the angel is introducing the manners and the traits of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And he will teach him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach him, whom Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, writing and wisdom and Torah and Injil. We uh, learn from traditions that uh, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was gifted with hifs of Torah, and he used to answer the scholars of Torah with uh, while he used to while they used to refuse him. The scholars of Torah, the Jew scholars, they used to refuse in accepting uh, and believing the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and the messages and the revelations which he was giving to them. When they used to refuse them, then to refute them and to answer them back, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam used to quote the verses of Torah them, himself to, and to make him a messenger to the children of Israel who will say, indeed, indeed, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord in that I design for you from clay that which is like the form of a bird. And then I breathe into it and it becomes a bird by the permission of Allah. And I cure the blind and the lepers and I give life to the dead by the permission of Allah. And I inform you of what you eat and what you store in your houses. Indeed, in that is a sign for you if you are the believers. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned all the miracles which were blessed to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, but repeatedly is it mentioned that it was not by the effort of the Prophet himself that he had succeeded in acquiring these miracles, but these miracles were blessed to him by the order and by the will of Allah.
and I have come confirming what was before me of the Orad, and to make lawful for you some of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. Indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him. That is the straight path. But when Isa salam, felt persistence in disbelief from them, he said, Man ansuari illallah, who are my supporters for the cause of Allah? The disciples, they said, Havari, they said, we are the supporters of Allah. Nahnu ansuarullah, we have believed in Allah and testify that we are Muslims submitting to him. So now the verse explain, then when the people around Hazrat Isa salam, they were continuously invited by Hazrat Isa salam towards faith on Allah, oneness of Allah, towards faith on the scripture he was presenting, towards the faith of his prophethood, they do not did not respond to his call. They did not respond to his call and they were obstinately and they were stubbornly in full arrogance. They continued and they persisted in a state of disbelief. So finally, he called out for help, saying what? Man answari illallah, who will be helpful for me in the path of Allah? Now, there were, there were companions who came out. Allah has called them as Havari. The Havari means what? They were those who came out as the companions helpful to Hazrat Isa salam. They were a group of 20 people. These were the disciples of Hazrat Isa salam. You know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has liked their response, has liked the way they responded to the call of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. The call was man ansari illallah. And they responded by saying, nahnu ansuarullah. It was this response. It was this behavior. It was this mannerism of the people, of uh, the, the, the disciples, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked so much that Allah has mentioned it in Surah Al-Imran. Allah has mentioned it in one of the, one of the greatest surahs of Quran. And Allah has Allah has let their let their story be in Quran till the day of judgment. So the lesson we learn from this is that what Allah likes the best from the bondsmen, what pleases Allah the most from the bondsmen, which behavior he likes the best, the which manner he likes the best is, which response pleases him the most is that when people are called, when somebody calls for the service of the religion of Islam, for the teaching, for the preachings of the messages of Quran and Hadith, for the implementation and for the guarding of the messages and the laws of Quran. When somebody is called out for that, the person responds out. The person responds by saying, Nahnu ansuarullah, that we will be the helpers for all these activities. Allah wants this response from his bondsmen that whenever, wherever, whoever calls for the help of preaching, teaching, implementation, and protection of Quran, the response should be in affirmative. The response should be in affirmative and the help should be extended to all those working for this, for this excellent cause. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of them. Our Lord, they said, these disciples who had said, they said, our Lord, we have believed in what you revealed and have followed the messengers, the message, uh, the messenger, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So register us among the witnesses to truth and the disbelievers planned. But Allah planned and Allah is the best of planners. Now, who planned, what was planned and against who was it all planned? Now, what happened was that when 20 companions responded to the call of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and then they became a group of 21 people, this created a feeling of fear. This created a feeling of distress and anxiety among the rulers and the common people of the time. This shows what? This shows the power of the believers. 
This shows the power and the force of the believers. Just a handful group of 20 people did the, did the rulers, they started fearing. So now once the rulers, they were insecure and they were fearing this group of fanatics, they planned to crucify Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And the allegations for crucifying him were two. They, uh, the allegations were they accused him of revolt against the rulers, number one, and they were accusing him from reverting from the ancestral religion. So they, they thought that he, they, that he was a revolt, he was a rebel, he was a rebel of the government, and he was a rebel of the religion of the ancestors also. So Hazrat Isa salam and his companions, when he found, when they found out the plan of the government and the rulers to crucify Hazrat Isa salam, so they had to take out, hide out in the caves. So Hazrat Isa salam, accompanied by his companions, they took hide out in the caves. But one out of the twenty disciples betrayed. He was like the black sheep of the lot, and he let out the secret of the hideout. They planned, even this person planned, even the army planned, even the rulers planned, makaru wa makarullah, they all planned, the betrayer planned, and the enemies planned, and the disbelievers planned, and the rulers planned, but their plans could not be conducted. The plans of Allah Almighty was which was conducted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a punishment to this person who had betrayed, as a punishment, we learn from the commentaries, the appearance of this person who had betrayed and who had let out the secret of the hideout, his appearance was changed and he resembled Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So the soldiers of the army, they considering him Hazrat Isa alayhi salam because of his appearance, his physical appearance, which had been created by the order of Allah. He was caught by the soldiers and then he was crucified. He was put to crucifixion and it was this, this betrayer of the disciples who was crucified. And so the people, so the people, they started believing that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam had been crucified. And this is what has been negated in these verses also, that it was not Hazrat Isa alayhi salam who was crucified. It was that disbeliever who had betrayed and had been punished and had been put to the crucifixion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had done what? <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had raised Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. He had raised Hazrat Isa alayhi salam both with his body and his souls to the heaven to be sent to be sent down again before the day of judgment as a major sign of the resurrection. So he was raised to heaven both with body and soul. So this is all being explained as an answer to the question which was put forward by the deputation of the religious scholars of Nijran. Mentioned when Allah said, O Isa alayhi salam, indeed I will take you and raise you to myself and purify you from those who disbelieve and make those who follow you in submission to Allah alone superior to those who believe, who disbelieve until the day of resurrection. Then to me is your return and I will judge between you concerning that in which you used to differ. And as for those who disbelieve, I will punish them with a severe punishment in this world. And hereafter, they will have no helpers. So this is a punishment which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning for whom the disbelievers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, that is the Jews. <coughs> But as for those who believed and did righteous deeds, he will give them in full their rewards. And Allah does not like the wrongdoers. This is what we recite to you of our verses and the precise and the wise message. Indeed, the example of Isa alayhi salam to Allah is like that of Adam alayhi salam. He created him from dust, whom? Adam alayhi salam. And then he said to him, be, and he was. Now, explaining and narrating the events in the life and in the, during the birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam, just amidst the whole of the events, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about the creation 
of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam has been quoted. Why? Because, you know, because of the fatherless birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the Christians, they had fabricated the false belief and they had started calling Hazrat Isa alayhi salam as Ibnullah, the son of Allah. And then after that, they started calling uh, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam as Elah, the deity himself. And this was all triggered because of uh, the concept that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, he was born without a father. So Allah, Nauzubillah, Min Zalik was his father. And then the false innovations of Ibn Allah followed this basic reason. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, Hazrat Adam alayhi salam was created from dust, miraculously without a mother, without a father. So if his miraculous creation without a father and without a mother did not end up making him or imagining him as an Allah or as a deity or as a son of Allah, then why do the Christians fabricate Hazrat Isa alayhi salam as a son of Allah? So this is why Hazrat Adam alayhi salam's creation has been mentioned to explain the, the control, the authority, the sovereignty of Allah as a creator and to negate and to refute the false concept of Trinity of the Christians. The truth is from your Lord. So do not be among the, among the doubters. Then whoever argues with you about it after this knowledge has come to you, say, so this is this verse was revealed after all the verses, all the previous verses from verse number 32 till this verse, they were revealed as an answer to the question of the deposition of uh, Nijran. The scholars, they asked, and all these verses were revealed, and Prophet Wasallam had recited these verses to them, explaining exactly what the events during the birth of Hazrat Maryam salam, Hazrat Isa salam, and what he had asked his disciples to do, and what is the actual and the true concept of uh, the concept of uh, Hazrat uh, Isa salam, and uh, negating the concept of Trinity, all these verses, when they were clearly narrated and recited in front of the deputation, despite listening to the events, all these verses, the people of Nijran, they failed to believe. They very obstinately, they very stubbornly and arrogantly, despite to despite they listening to all the true verses and the true events, they failed to believe and they did not believe. So here in this verse, Prophet wasallam was guided how to make a method to make them accept the truth. So it was suggested that tell them that come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, and then supplicate earnestly together and invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars among us. So this technique was suggested to uh, Prophet Wasallam, that you suggest to the people of Nijran to come in an open ground and you bring all of yourselves and we, I, Prophet Wasallam, I come with my family and with my family members and we supplicate to Allah that the curse be upon the liars. So this was an open challenge and the people of Nijran, they had actually they had actually re recognized Prophet Wasallam, and they had believed in hearts of hearts, but out of sheer obstinacy and out of sheer arrogance did they fail to believe. And they knew that if they supplicated for curse for the liar, the curse would come out on them. So despite realizing the actual truth and the actual state of affairs, they arrogantly returned and they did not comply to this suggestion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing directly that despite realizing the fact of the true fact, they were being arrogant and they were still persisting in this state of disobedience. Indeed, this is the true narration, and there is no deity except Allah. And indeed, Allah is the exalted in might and exalted in the wise. But if they turn away, then indeed Allah is knowing of the corruptors. Say, O people of the scripture, 
come to a word, come to a word that is equitable between you and us, that we will not worship except Allah and not associate anything with him and not take one another as lords instead of Allah. But if they turn away, then say, be a witness that we are Muslims submitting to him. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing, instructing Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions, and even all of us indirectly, the way and the manner to invite the people of the book. The people of the book are being invited for faith on Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on the Quran, highlighting the common things between common things between the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the teachings of their divine scriptures. The common points are being highlighted that you, the Jews and the Christians, you also believe in Allah. You also believe in the prophets and the divine scriptures. You also believe in angels and you also believe in the day of judgments. So highlighting the common points to invite them for belief in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran. So this verse indirectly is teaching all of us a style of preaching, a style of inviting, a style of dava. That is rather than, rather than highlighting the differences, rather than highlighting the differences, we need to highlight the common concepts, the common points. This is a hikmah of calling out even the different sects. Today we see that there are different sects in, in the followers of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So to take away the differences of opinion in all the clashes, the, the grievances, the grudges of all the different sects of the Muslims, we need to highlight, we need to highlight the common concepts and the common points rather than magnifying the differences. This is a very clear cut wisdom and hikmah for all forms of invitation towards Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us adopt this hikmah of invitation and dawah. O oh, people of scripture, why do you argue about Ibrahim alayhi salam while the Torah and Injil were not revealed until after him? Then will you not reason? Here you are, those who have argued about that of which you have some knowledge. But why do you argue about that of which you have no knowledge? And Allah knows, while you know not, Ibrahim salam was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was one inclining towards the truth, a Muslim submitting to Allah, and he was not of the polytheists. Indeed, the most worthy of Ibrahim salam among the people are those who followed him in submission to Allah and his prophet. And this prophet, whom? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those who believe in his message. And Allah is the ally of the believers. A faction of the people of the scriptures, they wish they could mislead you, but they do not mislead except themselves and they perceive it not. O oh, people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah while you witness to the truth? This is what? You know, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians in Torah and in Jeel, the New and the Old Testaments, they definitely mention they mention the name of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the name of his father, of his mother, of the city where he, will, where, where he will be born and the city where he will migrate. The names of those have been mentioned in the scriptures and the different uh, identifications have been mentioned and the behaviors and the manners of the companions and of the roles of their congregational salah to this perfection. They have been mentioned in the previous scriptures. So they had been promised by their prophets also that the seal of prophets, rahmatullah lameen, will be sent down. And they were taken promises and pledged by Allah and by their prophets that they will believe in the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they will believe in him, support him, and help him. But they had realized, they had recognized prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by all the things which were mentioned in their books. But despite the fact out of sheer obstinacy and arrogance, they failed to have faith. They failed to have 
faith in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Quran. And not only this, that they were disbelievers to both, they also misguided other people, like the people of Quraysh. They were the unlettered, they were illiterate, and the Bedouins of Mecca and Medina, when they found out and they heard about what Prophet ﷺ used to say, they, out of curiosity and trying to reconfirm, they used to go to the people of the book. And they used to say that you have divine scriptures and you being the people and the followers of prophets, you know what Allah says and how Allah reveals. What do you have to say about Prophet Sallallahu And what do you have to reconfirm about what he is presenting as a revolution and as a scripture of Allah? So despite the fact that they had realized and despite the fact they knew the truth of all these things, they would conceal and they would not reveal and they would misguide and they would not guide and they would announce against the truth. So this is what they've been warned against. O oh, people of the scripture, why do you conf confuse the truth with falsehood and conceal the truth while you know it? And a faction of the people of scripture say to each other, believe in that which was revealed to the believers at the beginning of the day and reject it at its end. Perhaps they will abandon their religion. This was also one of the defaming tricks of the Jews of Medina. What the Jews of Medina used to do out of planning and out of trick, they used to ask their Jew companions to embrace Islam and to announce in Medina that they had announced and declare in Medina that they had embraced Islam. And then to mix up with the Muslims, to stay with them, to attend their sessions. And then after some day, after a day or so, or a few days, then to revert back to Jewism. This they wanted to do, why? To create an impression and to create the impact that they, the people of the book, they, the literates, they, the knowledgeables, if they, after observing and after experiencing this message of or this religion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have reverted back to their original religion of Jewism, then obviously and very obviously there must be something wrong. There must be something wrong. There must be some fault. There must be some falsehood in the message which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is presenting. This was what? This was the behavior and the mannerism of the Jews and the Christians in those times. It was an anti-Islam effect. Remember, in all the ages, in all the times, in all the periods, even now and till, even till the day of judgment, the Jews, the, Muslim, the, Jews, the Christians, all the anti-Islam powers and forces, they will keep on trying to defame Islam, the messages and the teachings of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make us one of them. Choose us to be one of them who try to work against all these allegations, who try to raise their voice against all these defaming tactics and all these anti-Islam activities. And do not trust except those who follow your religion say indeed the true guidance is the guidance of Allah. Do you fear lest someone be given knowledge like you were given or that they would thereby argue with you before your Lord? Say, indeed, all bounty is in the hand of Allah. He grants it to whom he wills, and Allah is all-encompassing and wise. He selects for his mercy whom he wills, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. Allah select all of us for your mercy, for your pleasure, for your love, for your nearness, and for your bounties. Rabbighfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. And among the people of scripture is he who, if you entrust him with a great amount of wealth, he will return to you. These verses, this part of the verse we generally learn from uh, the commentaries, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appraised the behavior of uh, Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam. And among them is he 
who if you entrust him with a single silver coin, he will not return to you unless you are constantly standing over him demanding it. That is because they say, who? The Jews. They say, there is no blame upon us concerning the unlearned and they speak untruth about Allah while they know it. But yes, whoever fulfills his commitments and fears Allah, whoever fulfills his commitment and fears Allah, then indeed Allah loves those who fear him. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-quda wa tuqa wa al-afafa wa al-ghina. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba min yuhibbuka wa amala allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Indeed, those who exchange the covenant of Allah and their own oaths for a small price. Which small price? The price of the worldly gains, the worldly advantages, the interests of the world. Those who exchange the covenant of Allah and their own oaths for a small price will have no share in hereafter. And Allah will not speak to them or look at them on the day of resurrection, nor will purify them. And they will have a painful punishment. We know that wherever in the verses of Quran or in the traditions of a hadith, wherever these this word, these words are being saying, are being mentioned that Allah will not speak to them or look at them and will not purify them, then that that deed becomes what? It will be considered as a major sin. So what is a major sin? Is breaking the covenants of Allah and and giving away to the pledges and oaths and breach of promise or breach of fact. And indeed, there is among them a party who alter the scripture with their tongues. So you may think it is from the scripture, but it is not from the scripture. And they say, this is from Allah, but it is not from Allah. And they speak untruth about Allah while they know. It is not for a human prophet that Allah should give him the scripture and authority and prophethood. And then he would say to the people, be servants to me rather than Allah. This is what? This is negating all concepts of Trinity and the false innovations created by the Jews and the Christians regarding their prophets. He would not say to the people, be servants to me rather than Allah, but instead he would say, be pious scholars of the Lord because of what you have taught of the scripture and because of what you have studied. Nor could he, who a prophet, nor could he order you to take the angels and prophets as lords. Would he order you to disbelieve after you had been Muslims? And recall, recall of people of scripture when Allah took the covenant of the prophets saying, whatever I give you of the scripture and wisdom, and then there comes to you a messenger confirming what is with you. You must believe in him and support him. Allah said, have you acknowledged and taken upon that my commitment? All of them, the prophets, all of them, they said, we have acknowledged it. He said, then bear witness and I am with you among the witnesses. Now in this verse 81, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning his covenant with the prophets. When was this? This was at the time of the pledge with the creator, at the time of the pledge with the sustainer. We do learn from the verses of Quran and from traditions also that before the creation of the universe and before the creation of mankind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, created all the human beings which had to be created from Hazrat Adam alayhi salam to the last person on the day before the day of judgment. And they were presented and they were collected and gathered before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his throne. And then Allah asked them, it has been mentioned in Quran, in the verses of Quran, Allah asked them, am I not your sustainer? And they all agreed. It is mentioned in the verses of Quran, they all answered. They were all, there was a unanimous answer that why not? That meant what? That they all agreed and they made a covenant that they will be taking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they had agreed that Allah is their sustainer, the creator. Now, after this, 
After this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a direct covenant with the prophets and the messengers. And this was also an indirect covenant with all the followers also, that when after the, after the prophet and after the messenger, there would be an, another prophet sent, then all the believers and all the all the believers and all the followers of the previous prophet would believe, would believe in the succeeding prophet, would believe in the succeeding prophet and what he presents. And not only would they believe in the prophet who came after their prophet, would they believe in him, they would support him and they would respect and regard him. So this was a covenant made by all the prophets and all the messengers and indirectly by all their followers also. Now, this was a covenant which has been mentioned here in this Surah Al-Imran. Why? Because the Jews and the Christians, because of this covenant, they were duty bound. They were duty bound to have faith and believe in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Quran. They were duty bound to believe in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Quran. And not only that, they were duty bound because of this covenant. They were duty bound to help and support him also. But on the contrary, totally opposite to that, they were failing to believe and they were also opposing and they were also on fighting terms with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is why they have been reminded of the covenant their, their, their prophets had made and they had also agreed to it in their books and in their divine scriptures. And now how were they supposed to behave because they were supposed to fulfill the covenant and how actually they were being behave they were behaving. So they have been shown their behavior negating their covenant with Allah. And whoever turned away after that, they were the defiantly disobedient. So it is, so is so is it other than the religion of Allah they desire while to him have submitted all those within the heavens and the earth willingly or by compulsion and to him they will be returned. Say, we have believed in Allah in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub and the descendants and in what was given to Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinctions between any of them and we are Muslims submitting to him. We do what? All prophets had brought the religion of Islam. All prophets were Muslim. All the followers of the prophets were Muslims. And this is what way of Islam and faith and belief is being taught to the Jews and the Christians also. And whoever desires other than Islam as a religion never Ever will it be accepted from him and he is in here after he will be among the losers how shall Allah guide the people how shall Allah guide the people who disbelieved after their belief and had witnessed that the messenger is true and clear signs had come to them and Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people those their recompense will be that upon them is the curse of Allah and the angels and the people all together abiding eternally therein the punishment will not be lightened for them nor will they be reprieved except for those who repent after that and correct themselves for indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful Indeed, those who reject the message after their belief and they increase in disbelief, never will they, never will, never will their claimed repentance be accepted and they are the ones astray. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Indeed, those who disbelieve and die while they are disbelievers, never would the whole capacity of the earth in gold be accepted from one of them if he would seek to ransom himself with it. For those, there will be a painful punishment and they will have no helpers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the behavior, the behavior of all the Jews and all the Christians, how they fail to believe despite their covenants with Allah. But here Allah is mentioning that all these people who fail to believe despite the fact they realized the truth, despite the fact that they recognized and received the truth, and still 
arrogantly and obstinately they failed to refuse, then on the day of judgment, if as a, as a source of releasing from the hellfire, to get released from hellfire, if they would present as a ransom all the riches and the worlds in the world, that will not be accepted for them. Remember, in this world, in this world, we need to do what? Astaghfirullah Rabbim and Kulizam bin Waatubulaik. Repentance and forgiveness, seeking forgiveness, will be a source of expiation and atonement for all the sins. And in this world, there will, in their hereafter, even if a person comes up for ransom with whole of the world's riches, that will not be a ransom for the release from hellfire. But in this worldly life, Prophet Sallallahu has told all of us that save yourselves from hellfire, even if by spending a fraction of the date. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, help us all, guide us all, protect us all, and teach us all the root and the path to Jannah. Allahumma inni as'alu qal jannatul firdaus rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah Allahumma ajirna minan nar Allahumma ajirna minan nar Allahumma ajirna minan nar Verse 92 Allah says Lan tanalu albirra hatta tunfiku mimma tuhibbun Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah. From what? From that which you love. And whatever you spend, indeed, Allah is knowing of it. In this verse 92, Allah says, Lantana lul birra, that for sure, for sure, you will not attain, you will not reach the level of al bir. Allah is mentioning that the bondsmen, for their ability to attain bir, they need to spend out and spend out of what? Mimma tohibun, of what they are in love of. Al bir means what? Bir means all forms of virtuous, pious, and righteous deeds which are done at an extensive and a widespread level. So, what we need to understand from the verse is that a person to get pious and virtuous, virtuous and righteous and start doing such deeds, the person needs to do what? Needs to spend in the path of Allah. And not only spend, but spend out of his beloved personal commodities. Now, spending beloved items will thus make a person pious and righteous and virtuous deeds and obedience of Allah will become easy if he starts spending in the way of Allah. How is this related? Because you know that <coughs> a person can be pious. A person can come up to the level of righteous deeds, doing all that only and only if the person loves Allah. Because, you know, it is, it's always easy to obey the person we love. We find it very really easy to obey our husbands if we love them. We, we try to obey our children and we do, we make food for our sons the way they like or what they are fond of because we love them. So it is easy if we, if we love a person that it is easy to obey the person also. But, you know, if the state of affairs of a believer is that the heart is full of love of the world. The heart is full of the lust and the desire of the worldly riches and the love of the gold and silver. Then the whole of the heart being full of all that, there will be no space. There will be no place for the love of Allah. But you know what happens is that when we spend money or we spend charity in the path of Allah, the hand which takes out money from the wallet, the hand which takes out money from the pocket or from the drawers, or which signs a check, check for charity, that hand takes out the money. The hand takes out the money, but at the same time, it is also in an unfelt, in a concealed way, it is also taking out the love of the wealth and the love of the riches from the heart also. I repeat again, to make you understand this basic philosophy of life, that when a person is spending charity in the path of Allah and he puts his hand in his pocket or he, he puts his hand in his wallet, 
apparently what appears is that the hand is taking out a few a few coins or a few few notes out of the bag or out of the wallet but actually the state of affairs which is happening concurrently simultaneously is that this hand is also taking out the love of this wealth the love of this wealth this money the riches out of the heart so spending money or spending charity in the path of allah will empty the heart out of the love of this world and love of the money and the empty heart it will be easier to fill it up and to furnish it up with the love of allah with the love of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the desire to obey allah and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and with the fear of hereafter to fill up this heart with with piety so this is how spending in the path of allah and making charity for the sake of allah for the love of allah makes a person pious and makes righteous and virtuous deeds easy and possible for the person you know what when the verses of quran were revealed and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to recite the verses companions when they heard the verses they used to relate they used to try and comprehend and they used to analyze what they were doing and they used to react to the verses so when the companions they heard the recitation of this verse of surah al imran they reacted and they in desire of being pious because being pious and right is was like their ultimate desire so they started spending their beloved things in the path of allah like we learn that as as at abdullah bin umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he had Uh, um, uh, a she slave a female slave and um, he was very fond of her and she was really very nice and she gave him very good service but when he when he learned this verse he released her he freed her for the sake of allah similarly has atusama bin zaid radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he had a horse and the horse he very lovingly he used to call him by the name of sal like a nickname for the horse and when he when he recited this verse he he gave away this horse for the sake of jihad as a charity in the path of allah hazrat abu talha bin zaid al ansari he went through this verse and he realized that one of my dearest one of my nearest and beloved possessions is what an orchard an orchard of date palm trees in madina we learn from traditions in bukhari that this was the orchard of biraha it was in the center in the heart of madina and it had it had a lot of palm trees and there was a well also and there was his own residence in this place also and being in the center of madina prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to visit it very frequently also so this made it even more dearer to hazrat abu talha but he he gave out in the path of charity in the name of allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with the ability to spend to spend our beloved things may they be the money the gold the silver jewelry may it be our ma- our time because you know what time is time is money today Allah help us all the ability and the open heartedness to spend our gold and silver and jewelry and money and riches and our our transport vehicles and our houses and our knowledge and our skill and our professions and present our children also for the service of Allah Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim wa tub alaina innaka antat tawwabur rahim all food was lawful to the children of israel except what israel had ma- had made unlawful to himself before the torah was revealed say so bring the torah and recite it if you should be truthful and whoever invents about allah any untruth after that then those then those are truly the wrong doers say allah has told the truth so follow the religion of ibrahim alayhi salam inclining towards the truth and he was not of the polytheists verse number 96 inna awwala baytin wuzi'a lin nas indeed the first house of worship established for mankind was that at makka what baitullah khanaqaba blessed and guidance for the worlds in it where in kaaba are the clear signs which are the signs such as the standing place of ibrahim alayhi salam 
the second whoever enters it shall be safe the third and due to allah from the people is a pilgrimage to the house for whoever is able to find their two away but whoever disbelieves then indeed allah is free from need of the world in these two verses 96 and 97 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about baitullah khana kaaba that this was the first building to be erected to be erected on allah's earth and this was erected how many times, inshallah, I will be going um, going through the history of the construction of Khayna Kaaba in some other place. But here in these two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the signs. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the excellent signs of Khayna Kaaba and the excellence indirectly the excellence of baitullah some of the signs of khana kaaba they have been mentioned in the verses themselves the first sign is that allah says that it is mubarakan it is blessed it is mubarakan there will be barakah and we do realize and we do comprehend that in mecca and in baitullah there is a remarkable blessing there is a remarkable blessing in time and energy. People, we, all of us, when we are residing at our own places, in our own cities, we do not have all that blessing and barakah of time and energy. And it's not possible to do all that worships, which becomes very easily possible in, in Makkah, in Baitullah. This is what? This is a blessing of time, of energy, all. And then... Despite thousands and millions of people, pilgrims coming over and flooding over to Mecca, the, there is a remarkable blessing in all forms of food, all, all provisions and drinks, space, residence, transport, vehicles, nothing getting shot. This is a blessing of Mecca and this is a blessing of Baitullah itself. And then the next, uh, the next major sign <coughs> which has been mentioned here, it is a guidance for the world. Khana Kaaba itself is a source of remarkable and immense guidance for all the people of the world. Millions of people, millions and trillions of people, they come over to Khana Kaaba and there are so many among them who, are, who have a disobedient frame of mind, who have a transgressing manner, but they come here, they enter Khana Kaaba and this reforms it their frame of mind, their state of mind, their state of belief, and the state of faith, it elevates. And this is what? This is a miracle. This is a sign that Hanakaba itself is a source of guidance. And it has guided millions and trillions of disbelievers towards faith, disobedience towards obedience, those transgressing towards submission and surrendering. And this itself is a miracle of Hanakaba. And then the next sign, which Allah has mentioned here in this verse, is the standing place of Ibrahim, Maqam Ibrahim. This was what? This was a stone from heaven. We do learn from traditions that it was a stone from heaven which had come down as a miracle. And Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Ismail salam, went due to the order of Allah, they were obedient and they were patiently, reliantly working up to construct the house of Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his help. And this was the help in the form of this miracle stone from heaven. Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, he used to stand on the stone and the stone would move up and down and it would go around the building as well. This was exactly like a sort of a crane which was provided to them in those periods. And now you see thousands of years have passed. Thousands of years have passed and the stone is still there. The miraculous stone is still there. And then on the stone are the footprints of Muslim and Hanif and Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, so strong is the stone that since all these years, it hasn't broken off. It's still there. And when you look at it, it looks as if it was a model of wax with footprints of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. This itself is a miracle. And the conservation of the stone and the conservation of the footprints of Muslim and Hanif and Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, this is a miracle itself. 
And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us. This is what Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had desired. And he had requested Prophet sallallahu that it would be so nice that if we could offer a little bit of salah after our tawab on the maqam Ibrahim, and this verse was revealed according to the desire and wishes of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Allah has ordered to offer the supererogatory salah after performing talah, after performing the tawaf, and uh, to stand at the place of uh, at the place at uh, the standing place of Ibrahim alayhi salam and to offer salah. So this is this has been done with the purpose of making the people, all the pilgrims, those performing umrah, those performing hajj, those performing tawaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually wants them to stand up there, offer a little bit of salah, and actually see for them with their, with their real eyes, for, the, for them themselves to see the footprints of Muslim and Hanif and Bamaqana min al Mushrikeen, the one who was an obedient servant to Allah, the one who had actually submitted to Allah, the one who had refrained from all forms of polytheism and stuck up to the concept and faith on oneness, faith on belief on oneness of Allah. So actually looking at the footprints will make obedience, patience, and reliance easy for all those who experiencing this. And the fourth sign, which Allah mentions here, is that whoever enters it will be safe. So the safety, the peace, the peace and the safety in haram itself is a miracle and itself is a sign of haram. No place on Allah's earth, no place on Allah's earth is as peaceful, as safe, and as secure as Khana Kaaba itself. And then mentioning, obviously mentioning the well of Zamzam itself is a miracle. It is a sign of haram itself. How miraculously did it come out? And since hundreds and thousands of years, it's been there, very much there, pouring out water, endlessly, continuously with pressure coming out, and people traveling from all the nooks and corners of the world, carrying this water of Zamzam throughout the world. So this being a source of water for all the parts of the world, and the state of affairs in Makkah and the terrain in Makkah with no underground water level, no underground water level, deep, deep down does water come in the underground levels. And there is no, no surrounding rivers or streams or springs or fountains, but where does the water come from? And this water, this has the miracle it, it is sufficient for as a food and sufficient for drink. It is sufficient for thirst and hunger, both. Does not like normal water, does, does not, does not uh, quench the thirst, but is also is sufficient for the state of a hungry person. And then the miracle is that with all its qualities, if a little amount, a little bit like a half a cup of abizamzam is added to a full bottle full, a 20 little bottle of water, the whole of the water will acquire the same properties as Abizamzam. And then it doesn't go bad. It doesn't putrefy. It doesn't rot. It doesn't develop a bad taste or bad odor or smell. And this is all because of the water of, of the well of Zamzam. It has been fluorinated. Scientists today, they find out and they realize that it has been fluorinated. We people, we chlorinate our tanks to purify the water and to let stop the germs and the bacteria from growing and to purifying the water, we, we add chlorine. But scientists do realize that instead of chlorination, if the water was fluorinated, it would be better for purification as well as for health. And we know that the well of um, Zamzam, the floor and the walls itself, with all the pebbles and with all the wall, they do not grow any form of fungus or elga. And this is because of the fluorination of the water of the well. So this is what? This is all a sign. This is all a miracle of Kanakaba. And then the simple black stone, the black stone, which is loved by all. And even the building, if you see, it is, not, it is not a remarkable feat of architecture. It is a simple building, a square-shaped, simple building built out of black stones. But, 
But remember the attraction, the magnanimity, the pull of the building, the centrifugal force of the building, fanatics from all over the world, they come running towards it. All over the world, people come running towards it. Even if the 20th time person gets a chance to go and perform Umrah, there would be no second thoughts. And all of them come, they come, they walk into Haram with throbbing hearts and with eyes flowing with tears, crying every time they come and crying every time they go back. Just sitting in the courtyard of Haram, just simply looking at the building of Haram and crying and weeping and seeking forgiveness. Is there any other building in the world with which people behave like that? Is there any other building in the world which you see once, you see twice, and you ask for the third or the fourth time and you say, okay, I, I go again? No, you'll say, I've been there, done that. So this is only haram. Even the 20th, even the 50th time, the person gets an opportunity, goes running with a throbbing heart. And even for the 50th time, the person is returning, is crying, is weeping, and is playing and supplicating for returning again. So this is haram. Just looking at it is worship. So this is, this is the miracle of haram. And when you ever see an aerial view of pe people making tawaf, it looks as if there is a remarkable centrifugal force. There is a centrifugal force which is attracting them. The, the, sorry, there's a centripetal force which is attracting them towards haram. And they keep on making circles and circles around it. This is all what? This is a sign of haram. There's no building in the world when people return from there, they return crying with a heavy heart and with a heavy foot. Say, O oh people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses of Allah while Allah is witness over what you do? Say, O oh people of the scripture, why do you avert from the way of Allah those who believe, seeking to make it seem deviant while you are witnesses to the truth and Allah is not unaware of what you do? And you who have believed, if you obey a party of those who were given the scripture, they would turn you back after your belief to being unbelievers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning. Allah is warning the Jews and the Christians themselves of all their disobedience and all their malice and all the corruptions they are creating in their anti-Islam activities. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also warning all the believers and the Muslims to follow the Jews and the Christians. How could you disbelieve while to you are being recited the verses of Allah and among you is his messenger and whoever holds firmly to Allah has indeed been guided to a straight path. O oh, you who have believed, fear Allah, fear Allah as he should be feared and do not die except as a Muslim in submission to him. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all of us to be what? To be God-fearing, to fear Allah, to be pious. And his fear should be what Allah says, the fear of Allah should be above all forms of fear. Fear Allah, fear of what? Fear the wrath of Allah. Fear the accountability and questioning of Allah. Fear standing before Allah, fear his accountability, fear his punishment, fear the torments of his hellfire, and most of all, fear the displayer, fear the displayer of the creator, of the sustainer, of the Rahman and Ar Rahim. And Allah is instructing all of us, is enjoining to all of us to do what? Ittaqullah that the fear of Allah should be, should be more than all the other fears and constraints in our hearts. Above all means what? That it should be, the state of affairs should be like that. The fear of the displayer of Allah should be more than the fear of displayer of the spouse. A woman should not be worried. A woman should not be concerned about annoying her husband more then she is concerned about annoying her rub. The state of affairs should not be as like that the desire to please the family 
and the relatives should exceed the desire to please Allah. The stress, the stress of facing the questions and the interrogation of the friends and of the siblings should not be more than the stress and the anxiety of facing the questions and accountability of Allah. Allahumma hasibna hisab bin yasira. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. And now in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us how we can get, how we can develop the fear of Allah. How we can, how can we develop piety in our hearts and our souls? And how can the fear of Allah be instilled in the hearts of people? Allah says, وَاَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبَلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا وَاَعْتَسَمُوا بِحَبَلِ اللَّهِ Hold firmly to the rope of Allah. And how do you hold to the rope of Allah? Jami'a, all together. And do not do what? وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا And do not become divided. And then Allah quotes an example to say, and remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies and he brought your hearts together and you became by his favor brothers and you were on the edge of a pit of fire and he saved you from it. Thus, does Allah make clear to you his verses that you may be guided? So here in this verse, in the previous verse, verse number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided all of us to be God-fearing, to be pious, and to develop the feeling of piety and fear of Allah. And now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly explaining how, what method and what we need to do to instill taqwa, to instill piety in the hearts of people. As a Muslim community, we need to do what? Wa tasamu bi habalillah. We need Cling, we need to hold firmly and cling to the rope of Allah. What do we mean by the rope of Allah? When Prophet was asked that what is meant by Habalillah, he said that it, it means the Quran and the Hadith. So the verse is instructing all of us that we need to connect firmly to Quran and Hadith. We need to connect the people of the community. We need to connect the Muslims of the society firmly to Quran and Hadith. This will make them all God-fearing and pious. Why is it so? Because, you know, to be afraid of something, to be afraid of something or someone, we need to be aware. We need to be aware of the thing itself, the traits, the manners, the qualities, the control, the authority of that person or that thing. We need to be aware of that to be afraid of it. Let me give you, make you understand with an example. You know, a small baby, an infant, an infant just going crawling about has, has actually no difference between his fear of a rope and the fear of a snake. The baby does not fear a rope and the baby does not fear a snake also. But adults, we adults, we know about the poison of the snake. We are aware of the poisons of the snake and the effects created by the poisons. So we, we, we differ in our fear of a rope and we are scared to death. We are scared to death when we see a snake. So why is this difference? Why is this difference in fear is that we know and we don't know. So when we know about Allah, we have knowledge about the powers, of what, about the authority, about the control, about the attributes, about the sovereignty of Allah. Only, only then will we fear Allah. And only then the fear of Allah and piety will be instilled and infused in the hearts of the bondsmen. So how do we need to cling and hold to the rope of Allah? And how do we need to connect to Quran and Hadith? Allah says, collectively not as individuals you as muslims of, of, of a muslim society of a muslim community you all collectively all of you collectively you need to connect to quran and hadith so that you become what you become bunyanu marsus you become what a strong united wall against all the anti-islam powers and forces so you connect connectively to quran 
And then after collectively connecting with Quran, do not, do not do what? Do not become dis- divided in sects. Do not get divided into different schools of thoughts and different sects and stay united. So to prove, and then after saying all this, telling us how we can instill piety in the hearts of the Muslim bondsmen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to prove this formula, this method, how effective this formula and this suggested method is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an example, gives an example of people. Let's read that again. Remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies and he brought your hearts together and you became by the favor, by Allah's favor brothers. And when you were on the edge of a pit of fire, he saved you from it. So who is this Allah is talking about? Allah is talking about the people of Medina the tribes of Aws and Khazraj. The tribes of Aws and Khazraj, they were polytheists in the beginning, before the advent of Islam. They were polytheists and they were bitter enemies to each other. They were daggers drawn with each other. And there was a 200 years old battle, which is known as the Battle of Boaz in the history of Medina. This Battle of Boaz was continuing for the last 200 years. And there was massive and extensive killing. They, there was extensive bloodshed, which was going on between the two, two tribes. How did this finish off? What put an end to all this was what? What happened was with the advent of Islam, with the advent of Islam, when the light of Quran, with the scent of Hadith reached them in Medina, their, their enmity, it failed, it failed. And they became Muslim brothers. They became the Ansar of Medina. They united all their, all their grievances, all their grudges, all their fightings, all their battles ended when they held the rope of Allah. And then they became the they became the ansar of medina and they with open arms they invited the persecuted muslims of medina who immigrated to mecca well who immigrated from mecca to medina and these immigrants of medina they were the muhajirin and then it was because wata samubi habilillahi jamia they were all clinging on to quran and hadith they had all connected to the rope of allah they had all they had all accepted the messages of Quran and Hadith. So there was, there was the historical mawakhat, the historical Muslim brotherhood, the houses, the orchards, the businesses, the wealth, they were all divided and they shared. And this all happened. Why? This all happened. Why? They were on the pit of fire. There were flames of battle among them. And this all happened. Why? Because they had held on to the rope of Allah together without any divisions. So this is, this is the solution to all the problems which Allah has suggested. And now, how can this task of connecting all the people of the Muslim society, how this task of be conducted in a Muslim society, this is no easy job. This is no easy task of connecting the people with Quran and Hadith, it is not easy. And it's, it is not one man's job. It is not one man's job. So here in verse number 104, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining, is explaining the method, the four steps, the four steps and the four methods to connect the people to Quran and Hadith, to instill piety in the Muslim society. Now, these four steps have been suggested here that you cannot do it all by yourself. So do what? Let there be arising from you a nation. Doing what? Inviting to all that is good. Enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Those will be the successful. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just not suggested that to save your Muslim community from malice and from corruption and from transgression and disobedience, all you need to do is instill and infuse piety. How do you instill piety is to cling to the rope of Allah, Quran and Hadith and preach and teach the messages of Quran and Hadith. Now, how do you get this? Four steps. Four steps have been suggested. The first is you should join hands. 
join hands with each other because a single person can't be doing it. One person is a single person. When they are two, they become 11. When they are three ones, they become 111. So what you need to do is you need to join together. You need to make a group. You need to make a team and you need to form organizations for this purpose, joining together, joining together as Prophet Sallallahu said, Yadullahi fawqal jama'at, the help of Allah, the hand of Allah, the help of Allah, the support of Allah, the protection of Allah, the guidance of Allah is on whom? On a group of Muslims, on a team of Muslims, on an organization of Muslims working, working for this cause of Dava. That is why Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has instructed all of us, keep connected to a group of Muslims. Keep connected to a team or organization for Dava. For the fox, it attacks the goat which separates from its herd. So to save ourselves from the attack of the shaitan, Adubu Mubin, we need, we need connected. We need to stay connected with a jama'at with an organization, with a Muslim organization, with a team of Muslims working for this cause and for this purpose of qalam, alai qalamatullah. And then after you make a team, what do you do? Yad'una ilal khair. You should invite the people. This group should invite all those around, around them. Invite towards what? Towards khair. Tell them, introduce to them that we connected to Quran, we connected to Hadith, and we found the khair. We have received a lot of khair. We have received a lot of goodness. So you come all and you get connected to this. And then they do what? Enjoining what is right. And then as a fourth step, forbidding what is wrong. Yanhauna anil munkir, those will be the successful. Allah says, do not be like the ones who became divided and differed after the clear proofs and had come to them, and those will have a great punishment. On the day, some faces will turn white and some faces will turn black. As for those whose faces turn black, to them it will be said, Did you disbelieve after your belief? then taste the punishment of what you used to reject. But as for those whose faces will turn white, they will be within the mercy of Allah. They will abide therein eternally. These are the verses of Allah. We recite them to you in truth, and Allah wants no injustice to the worlds. To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth, and to Allah will all the matters be returned. You are the best nation. You are the best nation produced as an example for mankind. You enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If only the people of scripture had believed, it would have been better for them. Among them are the believers and most of them are defiantly disobedient. Here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning and labeling all of us as khaira ummatin, the best produced nation. And we have been produced for what? Ukhrijat nas, an example for the mankind. And the reason for this is that we have been held duty bound to do what? To Ya'maruna bil marufi wa yanhauna anil munkar. So this is a duty which has been made obligatory for all the followers of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Amar bil maruf wa nahi anil munkar. It is a popular Quranic phrase, and it means enjoining maruf and forbidding the munkar. Maruf means what? Maruf means anything which is good, which is known, which is well known, which is generally accepted, which is generally recognized, which is beneficial, which is approved by Sharia. And what is good and what is approved by Sharia is all that is halal and that is lawful. And munkar means what? So by that means, maruf, amar bil maruf will mean what? 
enjoining all that is good enjoining all which is beneficial and which is approved by sharia that is what we mean by amar bil maruf and what do we mean by munkar munkar is what it is exactly opposite to maruf so munkar means bad anything which is bad which is evil which is detestable which is disagreeable which is disapproved so nahi anil munkar would mean what forbidding the evil forbidding the evil the detestable disagreeable and disapproved deeds what is disapproved all forms of haram and all forms of things which are prohibited in islam stopping from that is nahi anil munkar as allah says in quran in surah al imran allah says وَلْتَقُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Allah says, And let there arise out of you a group of people who invite to goodness and enjoin what is right and forbid what is evil. They are the ones to attain felicity. Similarly, in verse 3, 110 of surah al-imran allah says kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat lin-nas ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhauna 'anil munkar you are the best group of people you are the best group of people evolve for mankind and you do what enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believing in allah If only the people of the book had faith it were best for them among them are some who have faith but most of them are transgressors so people having faith are supposed to do what do amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar and people who do not carry on amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar they are transgressors they are disobedience and they are not the followers and they are not the believers prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also in so many narrations explained the importance of amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar as he has been reported to say that they should always be a group of people calling towards good and forbidding them towards evil and this is obligatory upon the ummah remember this is an obligatory duty of all the people of the ummah of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam enjoining good and forbidding evil is a principle characteristic of a muslim a believer in islam may it be a male may it be a female should not only possess this characteristic but also mutually cooperate in the promotion of good and prohibition of evil there is no gender biased concept in islam as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah tauba verse 71 the believing men and the believing women they are all allies of one another they enjoin what is right and they forbid what is wrong and they establish prayer and they give zakat and they obey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger those allah will have mercy upon indeed allah is exalted in might and wise so allah the wise and allah the might has ordered us all what allah says that all those whether men or women if they are believers they should do what they should indulge in amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar and that is one behavior and that is one activity which will help allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy to be showered on them and similarly in verse 67 of surah tauba allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the hypocrite men and the hypocrite women in al munafiqina wal munafiqat they are what they are of one another they do what they enjoin what is wrong and they forbid what is right and they close their hands they have forgotten allah so he has forgotten them indeed the hypocrites it is they who are defiantly disobedient 
So the hypocrites, the disobedience, those who will be punished severely, and those who are cursed are the group of people who do not carry on Amr bil Maruf and Nahyan al Munkar. And Prophet ﷺ has ordered us that whoever amongst you sees an eel, he must change it with his hand. And if he is unable to do so, that is, that is he is unable to do so with his hand, then with his tongue. And if he is unable to do so, that is, he can't even change with his tongue, then with his heart. And that is the weakest form of faith. So, you know, in this hadith, Prophet Islam has mentioned all of us, all the Muslims, the response to, to whenever they experience or they observe an evil happening is to do what? That if they are capable to stop with hand, they can use their power, they can use their influence, they can use their status, their force to stop the bad things, then they should do that. But if a believer is not capable of that, that the person is not so influential or not so powerful and does not have a status and position and cannot stop by his hand, is incapable of stopping the evil with the hand, then at least, at least speak out against it. Use your tongue and speak out against it. But then if the person is incapable of speaking out also, and the per person is so weak, then even if that is not possible, then at least the person should detest that evil deed in his heart telling himself or herself that such evil thing which is happening in front of his or her eyes and the person is not able to do anything to stop it, the person should at least feel bad at heart. The person should feel bad at heart and this is the weakest form of faith. Those who do not even have this, they will not even have the weakest form of faith. That is those who are not even bothered about the evil happening and they do not even dislike in their hearts. They do not have faith in the true sense. So, the Samar Bil Maruf and Nahyan Al Munkar, it is a collective responsibility of the Muslim Ummah. And as Prophet Sallallahu has been reported by Abu Bakr Siddiq Rasulullah Ta'ala that Prophet Sallallahu said, when people see an oppressor, but do not prevent him from doing evil, it is likely that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them all. You see, like the people of Sabbath, they were all punished. So if people in a community, in a locality, in a society, they stop, they stop asking the wrongdoers and the evildoers to stop it, and they stop talking or working against the evil deeds, then there will be a torment of Allah which will be common to all. And similarly, Prophet ﷺ has been reported to say that by him in whose hands my life is, you either enjoy good and forbid evil or Allah will certainly soon send his punishment to you. And then you will make supplications and it will not be accepted. So this is what is the punishment of localities, communities, societies, families, groups of people who see the evil, who see the wrongdoings, who see the transgressions of Allah, who see people disobeying the commandments of Allah openly and they do not stand up. They do not stop and they do not try to stop. It has been reported in Bukhari that Prophet ﷺ narrated that you are on board. That he reported the condition of people who were on board. And he explained the situation of people, the likeliness the likeness of a man who observes the limits prescribed by Allah 
and of that man who transgresses them is like the people who got on board they got on board on a ship after casting lots and because of the lots some of them they were in the lower deck and because of the lots some of them they they were in the they were to occupy the upper deck so those who were in the lower deck of the ship they when they whenever they required water they had to go to the upper deck and because of that the occupants of the upper deck they would get annoyed and they would just like uh, get angry with them and so you know the people of the lower deck they decided what they said that if we make a hole hole in the bottom of the ship you know what the people of the upper deck they used to get angry with them that you keep on coming upstairs and you keep on disturbing us so upset with all this the people of the lower deck who definitely did need water they decided that they would make a hole in the bottom of the ship and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if the occupants of the upper and the lower deck they left them to carry out their design then they would all be drowned but if they do not let them go ahead all of them would remain safe so if a group of people in the society is doing evil deeds and doing wrong deeds and committing sins if the rest of the society doesn't stop them then the whole of the community will be will be drowned in these sinful activities now here i would want to highlight one thing that you know most of the muslims they think that amr bil maruf and nahi anil munkar that is enjoining goodness and stopping from evil deeds this is just and just the responsibility of the teachers of quran and the preachers of quran and the general community of muslims is just expected and needed to offer salah to fast to perform hajj and that is all what is the duty of a muslim now believe you me this is not like that this is a duty of all the muslims of a community and a society because this is what this is actually the cleaning of the society and how how very important cleaning and purification is if we just note around and look around ourselves allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the system of cleaning in the earth and the universe you must have observed an animal dies and the dead body of the animal is immediately removed by insects by scavengers and this is to do what this is to keep the earth clean otherwise if this would all not happen and the scavengers and the insects they would all not do this then there would be filth and there would be smell on all the ground and all the earth rain rain is what it is a cleaning method it cleans up the atmosphere it cleans up the land it cleans up the vegetation if you look in our bodies in our systems the eye when there is a dust storm and dust enters in our eyes what happens there is there is a lacrimal gland above the eyes in the bony orbit there is a lacrimal gland and immediately when there is some dust or something irritating in the eye that lacrimal gland it starts pouring the lacrimal secretions the water works the tears and these tears they flow when they wash off the eye and clean it a foreign body gets in the nose immediately the person sneezes the air gushes out and the nose is clean something in the throat the person coughs and the throat is clean there is a cut in the skin immediately the blood flows it washes and then the antibodies the cells in the blood they fight the germs and they provide immunity and they keep the wounds sterile and clean and then we are all ladies we are housewives we know our houses our kitchens how frequently do we need to clean them 
how frequently do we need to clean our kitchens and how meticulously do we need to clean our kitchens so this amar bil maruf and nahi anil munkar is what it is an action and it is a step to clean the society to keep the society of the community clean and pure from sins from evil deeds from transgressions from disobedience and i would end my discussion <coughs> narrating the story of or explaining the events as narrated by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that there was a community of bani israel and it was a disobedient locality and the people there were transgressing and they were disobeying and they were sinful but in the same locality there was a person who was very very pious he was very pious he was a believer and he used to worship and he used to stand all night in the supererogatory prayers offering salah but the whole community was indulging in sins seeing this sinning and sinful locality allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels to to send his torment and to wipe off the locality the angels came and they saw the locality and they also observed that pious person and they went back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they asked that you are you have asked us to destroy this city but you know what allah there is a very pious person who worships who stands for your worship throughout the night what do we do with him you know what allah said allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered he ordered the angel to start start the torment and start the destructive punishment from the very house of that person who worships who worships all night why why because he just thought that to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he needed supererogatory he needed supererogatory prayers but all around him all around in the community people were indulging in sins in disobedience and they were transgressing but he would stay preoccupied in his own world he didn't even stop them with his hand he did not even comment anything with his tongue and he didn't even feel bad in his heart so the punishment would start from the house of that person allahumma la taj'alna minhum allahumma la taj'alna minhum Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala help us realize the importance of stopping evil and sins around us and help us stop it with our hands with our tongues and help us help us reject it and dislike it in our hearts were taken except for a covenant from Allah and a rope from the Muslims and they have drawn up themselves anger from Allah and have been put under destitution that is because they disbelieved in the verses of Allah and killed the prophets without right that is because they disobeyed and habitually transgressed so in these verses number 100 into 117 Allah is explaining the behavior the disobedient and transgressing behavior of the Jews they are not at all the same among the people of the scripture is a community standing in obedience reciting the verses of Allah during the periods of night and prostrating in prayers they believe in Allah and the last day and they enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and hasten to good deeds and those are among the righteous and whatever good they do never will it be removed from them and Allah is knowing of the righteous indeed those who disbelieve never will their wealth or their children avail them against Allah at all and those are the companions of fire they will abide therein eternally allahumma ajirna minan nar
The example of what is spent in this worldly life is like that of a wind containing frost, which strikes the harvest of a people who have wronged themselves and destroys it. And Allah has wronged, Allah has not wronged them, but they wrong themselves. O oh, you who have believed, do not take as intimates those other than yourselves, for they will not spare you any ruin. They wish you, they wish you would have hardships. Hatred has already appeared from their mouths, and what their breasts conceal is greater. We have certainly made clear to you the signs if you use reason. So here in these verses, number 118 to 120, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told and warned the Muslims how the Jews think and how they plan against the Muslims, warning them of all the wrong deeds, the, all the wrong deeds and all the enmity of the Jews and all their anti-Islam tricks. Here you are loving them, but they are not loving you while you believe in the scriptures, all of it. And when they meet you, they say, we believe. But when they are alone, they bite their fingertips at your rage, say, die in your rage. Indeed, Allah is knowing of that within the breasts. Verse 120, if good touches you, it distresses them. But if harm strikes you, they rejoice at it. And if you are patient and you fear Allah, their plot will not harm you at all. Indeed, Allah is encompassing of what they do. So in this, uh, these verses, Allah has talked about the wrong manners and the evil deeds and plannings and tricks and anti-Islam activities of the Jews. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned the Muslims of all their defaming tactics and their anti-Islamic activities. Now, informing and introducing and warning against such a bitter enemy, giving information and giving introduction and giving warning against such a bitter enemy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last part of the verse tells how the Muslims can protect themselves from the evil doings of the Jew enemies. Allah says that if you do two things, in tasbiru wa tattaku, if you are patient, that is that you are obedient to Allah and whatever physical, psychological, emotional, social, whatever form of crises or hardships, they befall you because of your obedience to Allah and the Prophet wasallam. you stay patient and you are steadfast and you perseverantly go on, carry on in your obedience and you are patient. And then you do what? You do not fear any worldly power. You fear Allah and you are pious and righteous. Then none of their malice, none of their corruptions, none of their tricks or plans will be able to harm you. So we need to do what? We need to fear Allah, be pious and righty, and we need to stay patient and steadfast in obedience to save ourselves, all the Muslims of the Ummah, to save themselves from the, from the evil plans and from the enmity of the Jews. And then to prove the efficacy of these two in Tasbiru wa Tattaku, in the following verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will narrate the events of the battle of Uhud when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, helped the Muslims, when the Muslims were patient and they were, they were patient and they were God-fearing, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held them and when they deviated. And when they deviated and they lost obedience and they lost the fear of Allah and they developed the love of this world, then they deviated, then the help and the mercy of Allah all to turn away and they had to suffer heavy losses. Verse 121. Wa ghadawta min ahlika tubavviul mu'minina maqa'ida lil kital. Wallahu sami'un alim. And remember when Prophet وسلم, left your family in the morning to post the believers at their stations for the battle of Uhud and Allah is hearing and knowing. 
Now from here onwards is the discussion of the events of Battle of Uhud. So before going to the verses, I will narrate the events of the battle briefly so that knowing the events, it will be easier to understand the message of the verses. Now, after the first year when Muslims had emigrated from Mecca to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start with allowed the Muslims to make battle or to do qital or jihad. The second year, Muslims were ordered to make qital, as in Surah Baqarah, Allah ordered, Qutiba alaykum al qitalu wa huwa lakum. And also the charter of fighting was explained in detail, as we've already read through in the Surah Baqarah. Now, after these two orders, in the second year, the Ramzan of second year, there was the Battle of Badr, where 300 Mujahideen from Medina, they were to face an army of 1,000 soldiers of Quraysh led by Abu Jahl, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped and uh, the Muslims, they had a remarkable victory and the arrogant Meccan army had to face a terrible defeat. Now to take the revenge and also to teach the Muslims a lesson for the future and uh, the army, the people of Quraysh and people of Mecca, they decided to attack the Muslims next year. Abu Jahl had died in the Battle of Badr, uh, in the Battle of Badr and Abu Sufyan was now leading the Quraysh. Now it was uh, decided and it was announced that all the income which they will be getting from the usury or, intra or interest for the next year, it will be collected for the purpose of battle against the Muslims. And the Quraysh, they also succeeded to motivate the other tribes around Mecca to uh, help them. And uh, finally, they succeeded in gathering an army of 3,000 soldiers. Hazrat Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the paternal uncle of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after Badr, he had been greatly touched by the kindness of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and so he had accepted Islam. But he had not revealed his Islam, he had kept it secret and it was concealed. He managed to inform Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the intentions of the Meccans and their preparations to advance towards Medina for an attack. As for the order of Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered uh, counseling, wa'mur shura bainahum, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathered his companions and uh, for consultation and whether they should fight remaining and staying in Mecca, in Medina, or they should advance to, uh, to face the Meccan army. The courageous and the sincere companions, they, their suggestions were that they should leave Medina and they should advance to fight the Meccans like brave people. And the hypocrites, how were they opposed? And they suggested that they should stay in Medina and wait for the army of Mecca to come. <coughs> Hazrat um, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and who, who was the uncle of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he insisted on advancing for battle and he took an oath that he will not eat or drink till he goes out of Medina and he fights the enemy advancing from their own city. Now, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to the suggestions, he gave orders for the preparation of an army of Mujahideen. And so finally, an army of 1,000 Mujahideen left Medina towards, the, towards Ohad. Halfway through the leader of hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, he said that uh, he took away 250 of his companions and they came back to Medina. And they were saying that they were not, their suggestions were not accepted and they had not been heard. So they will not, they will not uh, support the Muslims also. Now the Muslim army reached Uhud before the Meccan army and the ground of Uhud, this is sort of a valley and it is encircled by high mountains. And these mountains are of hard black igneous rocks, which were made thousands of years before by volcanic eruptions. And so around this, this ground of Uhud, <coughs> there are mountains on all the sides. 
And so Prophet Sallallahu arriving there, he appointed the army chiefs in the battlefield. They were deputated, uh, they were put, they were advised to stay in their specific positions. Hazrat Hamza, radiallahu ta'ala, and who he was appointed in the center of the army, Hazrat Ali on the right side, and Hazrat Migdad bin Aswad on the right, on the left wing. And then Prophet Sallallahu also took notice of the mountain pass, which was between the mountains at the back of the army. Between the two mountains, there was a path through which the army could have attacked the Muslims also. So Prophet Sallallahu he appointed a group of 30 archers under the leadership of Hazrat Abdullah bin Jubair. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu gave them very strict instructions and he addressed them and told them that the security and the guarding of the back of the army of Muslims is your duty. And if you do not leave the position, then we will stay safe. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu very strictly ordered them that you do not leave the position of this mountain pass, even if you see that our flesh and bones are being cut off. And he clearly instructed them that do not leave your post until and unless you receive an order from the battlefield. And then Prophet Sallallahu said that, oh Allah, be a witness. Now, when the battle started, the companions, uh, they fought courageously, laying down their lives one after the other. There was uh, the martyr of Uhud, was Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was martyred by a Negro slave, Wahshi, because uh, Hind had promised to free him, to set him free if he had killed Hazrat uh, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And uh, when Hind, she got the news that uh, Prophet, uh, that Hazrat Hamza had been killed by Washi and Washi had succeeded, she walked to the battlefield and she cut open, she cut open Hazrat Hamza's chest and abdomen and she took out his liver and she was chewing it and she was spitting it in revenge. How crude, how crude, how hard-hearted and how inhuman these people were. And you will see that the teachings and the preaching and the invitations and the behavior of Prophet ﷺ was, which converted them towards Islam also. Hazrat Musa bin Umair, a companion of Prophet ﷺ, he was the flag bearer in the battle of Uhud. And um, his, he was holding the flag of the Muslim army in his right hand. And his right hand was cut and he shifted the flag to the left hand. And then his left hand was also cut. And then he was holding the flag with the, both the stumps of the arms. And uh, he was then martyred. And uh, then there was the martyrdom of Hazrat Hamza, Hazrat Hanzala, and who his wife explains that he had been married the day the army left Medina. The, the army left for Medina for Uhud. He was married the same day. And he was with his new bride when he heard the announcement of the departure of the army. And he left in urgency and he even forgot to take the bath of purity. And when he entered the battlefield, there he was fighting and he was martyred. And Prophet Sallallahu informed the companions that I have been told that Hanzala was given a bath by the angels with the water from a fountain of Jannah, that is with the water of the Sneem. And when companions, they saw, they saw that droplets were trickling down the hair of the dead body of Hazrat Hanzala radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And now, because of all these brave sacrifices and all this, the brave manner and the courageous manner, the sincere companions they were fighting, they had obeyed. They had obeyed Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They had, they had fought patiently and they had relied on the promises of Allah. So the help of Allah came. The rule of Allah, inna Allah ma'aswabirin, it operated and the help of Allah joined the Muslim army. And the Muslim army of 750, they came out, victor they came out victor victorious as compared to the Meccan army of 3,000. This was with what? This was nasrum min Allah, the help of Allah. Now, the companions themselves, they, they have reported that they saw the enemy flee. And they also, they've also mentioned that they saw that the ladies of Quraysh, they also, they were running away in terror, raising their gowns to expose their legs. 
So this proved what? That initially the Muslims, they came out victorious with the help of Allah. And after this, the Muslim warriors, the Mujahideen, they started collecting the booty. Now, this is where the issue arose. And this is where the issue arose and it caused the reversal of the whole scenario. The archers who had been strictly instructed by Prophet Sallallahu not to leave the mountain pass and to guard the mountain pass at the back. They, they saw that the Mujahideen, the soldiers, they were collecting the booty. Now, what happened was that the most disliked feeling, which feeling? The love of the world, the love of the worldly riches and the lust and the desire of the money. As Allah explains in Quran, innahu lahubbil khayri la shadid, that the only problem, the only issue which distracts you, which diverts you, which deviates you is what? Is the love of money. And Allah says in Quran, jama. You are madly in love with the wealthy riches, with the worldly riches and with all the wealth of this world. So these feelings, they overpowered them. And they developed the feeling that the booty will be all gathered and it will be taken up by the Mujahideen and they will be deprived. And you know what? Some of them, they also developed a thought and a feeling that even Prophet وسلم, might be unjust and he might be unfair and deprive them of the shares of uh, booty of the war. So when such feelings developed, they left their duty, they disobeyed Prophet Sallallahu instructions, and they also came in the battlefield and they started collecting the booty themselves. Hazrat Abdullah bin Jubair, he was continuously calling them from behind and reminding them of Prophet Sallallahu instructions, but they did not respond and they did not even obey their leader. So disobedience on top of disobedience, they continued out of sheer love of the wealth of this world. Now this disobedience of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and disregarding the orders of their leaders because of what? Because of the love of money, this was disliked by Allah. And this led to the reversal of the situations. Now, how did the reversal take place was that while the Meccan army was going back, Hazrat Khalid bin Walid, who till then was still a non-believer, and he was in the army of the enemy. He caught sight of the pass behind the Muslim army that it was no longer guarded and protected. So he immediately stopped. <coughs> we, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with excellent, he had excellent God-gifted military skills. So till now, all these military skills, they were being used for the, for not for the Muslim army, but they were you being used for the Muslim enemies. Now he stopped there and he told Abu Sufyan that they should attack again. And he told him that he will go all around the mountain to attack the unaware, unaware Muslim enemy from their back through the unguarded uh, mountain pass. And he asked Abu Sufyan to attack the Muslim army from the front. So what they planned was that they would like sandwich the Muslim army between the two armies, uh, the two Quraysh armies attacking from the front and from the back. <coughs> the Muslims, they all the Mujahideen, they were busy collecting the booty and the attack was like totally unexpected. They were taken unaware. And so what happened was that the Muslims, they started running away from the battlefield, leaving Prophet Sallallahu alone. And this happened because of many factors. Why did they flee from the battlefield and why did they leave uh, the battlefield was many factors, which were the triggering factor were that they were taken by surprise. They were taken in a total state of shock. The second is that after the martyrdom of Hazrat Musa bin Omer, who somehow resembled Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to some extent, there was a rumor which spread in the Muslim army that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been martyred. Moreover, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself, he got injured and he fainted because of excessive bleeding, he fell down. And then another rumor spread again that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been martyred. 
So they lost hope. They were disappointed and they were detected. And hence they left the battlefield. Now in the whole process, Prophet Sallallahu was calling to calling to all of those companions who were running away from the battlefield. And Prophet Sallallahu was calling out, Ilayya ibadullah, Ilayya ibadullah, O servants of Allah, come towards me. But none of them, they, they did not pay any attention. And they were just like continuously running away, except a few, a very few sincere companions. They did respond to the call and they did come in this difficult time to uh, protect and guard Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of them being Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqas. He came back and he really fought very, very bravely to protect and guard Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from all around. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called out to him, Ya Saad, Fidaqa, Abi wa Ummi, O Saad, my parents be sacrificed on you. And you know what? Hazrat Saad, and who he used to feel very happy and he used to feel uh, proud about it, about it, that no one had received these words from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst the companions other than him. And then there was Hazrat Talha bin Ubaid, who he actually endangered his life for the sake of uh, protecting Prophet. He was like doing three things simultaneously. He would attack the advancing enemy, the enemy, the soldiers of the enemy. They were who they were attacking Prophet from all the sides. He would attack all these uh, soldiers of the enemy. And at the same time, he was working to protect Prophet Sallallahu from their attack also. Like sometimes he was, he put forward his arm, his, his shoulder, his chest, his back in front of the swords of the enemy who were attacking Prophet Sallallahu So he was attacking the enemy themselves, trying to retreat them. And then when they attacked Prophet Sallallahu he was presenting before their swords his own body to protect Prophet Sallallahu And when for some time, for a short period, when the enemy retreated, then in that interim period, in that brief time, he would carry Prophet Sallallahu on his shoulder to shift him to a slightly higher and a safer place. And finally, he succeeded to shift Prophet Sallallahu to a safe place. But in the whole period, he had he had been injured so badly and he had bled that he collapsed and he fell in a ditch. And uh, then some other companions, Hazrat uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Hazrat Umar, and Hazrat Ubaida, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, they came over to Prophet Sallallahu And the first thing which Prophet Sallallahu had told them was that you go and find how and what, in which condition is Abu Talha. And when they found out, he had 40 deep cuts and he had fainted and he had fallen. There he was lying in a deep ditch. And when Prophet Sallallahu was informed that he was still alive, he said that whoever wants to see a living martyr, he should see Hazrat Talha. And he was also called as Al Khair after this battle. And then uh, the companions who came around to protect Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi they saw that uh, he was, he was um, excessively uh, injured. But before talking about what they did, I would want to mention about what my favorite, my beloved companion, Hazrat Umara radiallahu ta'ala anha, she did for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, she had joined the Muslim army with her husband and with her elder son, Hazrat uh, Abdullah. Now she was, what she was doing was that she was giving water to the wounded soldiers and she was uh, dressing their wounds also. But when she saw that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was alone and he was insecure, she called out to her son, Abdullah, that Abdullah, come along, let's protect Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi This is what, this is a mother calling her son for the protection of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allahumma ja'alna minhum. And she, she actually guarded Prophet Sallallahu all around him like a brave tigress. And there she was all around him. And then in the end, she was, she was wounded and she was injured and she fell. And after the battle, Prophet Sallallahu visited her. 
And he was so pleased with the way she had protected Prophet with the company of her son that he asked her, uh, Ume Amara, ask what you want to. But she did not ask for the wealth and property, the authority or power or anything of the sort. What she asked, she said, the Prophet please supplicate for me and for my family that we may be your neighbors in Jannah. And Prophet Sallallahu he raised his hands and he supplicated, Allahumma rafaqa ifil jannah. And she said that now I don't have any fear or any anxiety. Subhanallah. These were the companions. These were the sincere companions of Prophet Sallallahu who did not even, who did not even bother to lay their lives down for the protection of Prophet Sallallahu And then were the other companions, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar Razillahu Ta'ala Anhu, and Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah. They came and they found that there were two metal rings. They had pierced the cheek of Prophet Sallallahu They were piercing his flesh. And uh, Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, he encircled this metal ring with his teeth to open it up. And he took it out, but in the process, his tooth broke and blood started spurting out. And the second ring was still there. So he repeated the process again, and his second tooth also broke in the process. What pain and how much bleeding there was, but this was what? this In this battle of Uhud, all the companions, they, they clearly proved that the love of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for all of them was even more than the love for themselves. Now, such a love, such sincere sacrifices of the companions again, again brought the help of Allah and the support of Allah joined all of them and the enemy, <coughs> the enemy, despite being at the winning end by the will of Allah, they felt overpowered and by the support of Allah, they lost hope and they retreated. The enemy, despite the fact that they were in the winning position, they, they felt overpowered, they left their hope and they retreated, leaving the Muslims in the battlefield. And so what lessons and what models we learn from this whole event is that it is not the number. It is not the number, the strength, the arms, the ammunition of the forces, of the armies, which is important. It is the behavior. It is the behavior and the manner which is decisive for the victory of the army, of the Muslim army. When the Muslim army the, the people of the Muslim army, the Mujahideen, the soldiers of the Muslim army, they obey the orders of Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they stay patient. They stay patient in their obedience and they have reliance in the promises of Allah. Then the help and the support of Allah befalls them. And we learn what? Wa in tasbiru wa tattaku. If you stay patient and if you fear Allah then all their plans and all their tricks, they will not harm you to whatever they try and whatever they plan. This is what the events of Uhud, they are highlighting for all of us, that as long as the Muslim army stays patience and obedience and fear of Allah, then even the greatest, even the greatest, the most powerful and the highly equipped of enemy forces will not be able to harm them. Allah, help us all stay obedient. Help us all be perseverant and patient and help us all develop the fear of Allah and help us all be among those who rely in Allah. Hasbunallah, ni'am al-mawla wa ni'am al-wakil. Hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu, alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. Verse number 121. 
and remember when you left your family in the morning to post the believers at their stations. Which stations for the Battle of Uhud? Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the center, Hazrat Ali on the right, and Hazrat Mikdad bin Aswad on the left wing. And Allah is hearing and knowing. When the two parties among you were about to lose courage, but Allah was their ally, and upon Allah the believers should rely. Now this was when uh, Abdullah bin Ubay, he took away 250 of his companions, the hypocrites, the two tribes of Banu Salma and Banu Harsa, they also were double-minded and they were shaken. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them, uh, made them steadfast and they carried on to accompany the Muslim army. Verse 123, and already had Allah given you victory at the battle of Badr, while you were few in number, then fear Allah, perhaps you will be grateful. So Allah here is now reminding them of the victory of Badr just the last year. Remember, when you said to the believers, is it not sufficient for you that your Lord should reinforce you with 3,000 angels sent down? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promise 3,000 soul angels being sent down is because the news had reached the Muslims that the Meccan army had 3,000 soldiers and they were advancing with an army of 3,000 soldiers towards Medina. Yes, if you remain patient and conscious of Allah and the enemy come upon you attacking in rage, your Lord will reinforce you with 5,000 angels having marks of distinction. So Allah promised 5,000 angels to make them even more relaxed and contented. And Allah made it not except as a sign of good tidings for you and to reassure your hearts thereby. And victory is not except from Allah, the exalted in might, the wise, that he might cut down a section of the disbelievers or suppress them so that they might turn back disappointed. Not for you, but for Allah is the decision whether he should cut them down or forgive them, or punish them, for indeed they are wrongdoers. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. He forgives whom he wills and punishes whom he wills, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. O you who have believed, do not consume, usually doubled and multiplied, but fear Allah that you may be successful." In these verses 130 to 133, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a don't of Allah regarding interest or regarding the consumption of usury. Now, the first thing which we need to understand is that why during the discussion of events of the Battle of Uhud has Allah talked about the consumption of usury? This is because Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh now, Abu Sufyan had announced that all the money they will collect from usury, all the people of Quraysh and the people of Mecca, all the money which they will collect from interest, it will be used for the preparation of an army against the Muslims. Now, since now here in Uhud, Muslims, they had suffered a heavy loss, 70 lives and many of the Muslims injured, so because of this heavy loss, uh, the Meccans, they had been victorious. And then there was a chance that the Muslims, they might start thinking and they might start assuming that interest is useful and helpful in certain situations. So to rule out any such thought, so to rule out any such thought which might crop up in the mind of Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated here the consumption of usury in these verses. Now, regarding uh, the interest and usury or riba, this is the second verse according to the order of revolution. The first verse was revealed in Surah Rum, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had just conveyed a dislike of interest and uh, was clearly um, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no announcement of usually being unlawful was made there. In the verses of Surah Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just conveyed a dislike of uh, consumption or using, taking advantage of interest has been announced. 
Now here, although the verse does not announce the hurremat or the unlawful, being unlawful of usury, but where very, very clearly does Allah disapprove of any form of riba being taken by the Muslims? Allah says what? Allah says, la ta'kulu, do not consume usury, that so it is a clear cut do of don't of Quran. La taqulu is what? A clear cut don't of Quran. Allah is forbidding the Muslims to take all forms of usury. The second Allah says, Wattaqullah, fear Allah. So to be pious, to be God fearing, we need to do what? We need to stay away from interest. And then Allah says, La Allah kum tuflihun, to be successful. To be successful here and hereafter, we need to do what? We need to refrain from usury. And then Allah says, fear the fire. So to escape the fire, to escape the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers, we need to do what? We need to stay away from all forms of riba. And then Allah says, in the verse next, Allah says, Atiullah, obey Allah. Atiullah wa atiul Rasul, that you may obtain mercy. So to obey Allah and to obey the Prophet وسلم, we need to refrain from all forms of riba. And to obtain the mercy of Allah, we need to stay away from riba. And then Allah says, Wasariu. That if we want to hasten towards the forgiveness and we want to hasten towards the attainment of Jannah, we need to, we need to forego all forms of interest and all forms of riba. So this is this is not the this is not the final order regarding riba. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned it to be a source of piety. It is a source of success in this world here and hereafter. It is a source of release or escape from hellfire to obey and for the obedience of Allah and his prophet to acquire the mercy of Allah and to hasten towards forgiveness and for the attainment of Jannah. We need what? We need to refrain from all forms of riba. And finally, the final and the third order regarding the riba and usury was in the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, which we've already gone through. So now in this verse, 133, Allah says what? Sari mir rabbikum. Hasten towards the forgiveness from your Lord. And what? And, and Jannah the gardens which are like what as wide as the heavens and the earth and they have been what they have been prepared for whom all right that little muttaqeen all right that little muttaqeen they have been prepared for the righteous and for the pious so the first thing we learn from here is that jannah has been prepared. Jannah is there. It is very much there. Jannah is existent and Jannah is ready for the pious and for the righteous. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Now in these verses, in this verse and the following few verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the bondsmen to hurry and to hasten towards the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to attain the to attain the bounties and to attain the destination of Jannah. And Jannah is being promised for whom? For the God-fearing, for the pious and for the righteous. And then in the next few verses, verses 134 to 136, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the manners, explains the traits of these God-fearing, pious, right to people who will be blessed with the blessings and the bounties of Jannah. Allah, help us remember all these manners and adopt all these traits in our personality also. So the, the manners and the traits of the muttaqeen or the pious people who will be blessed with Jannah is what? 
those who do what? Who spend in the cars of Allah when during ease and hardships and who restrain anger and who pardon the people and Allah loves the doers of good. So the first manner of those of the pious who will who have been promised as the blessing of Jannah is that they spend in the path of Allah. They spend in the path of Allah to trade for and to barter for the gifts of Jannah. They spend charity in the path of Allah. And they spend both conditions in ease and in hardships. Because, you know, generally, we do see two forms of responses that you see that either people, they spend in ease, that is when they have surplus and when they are, they are in a condition of afford affordability, they, they spend, but they fail to spend when they are slightly economically, they are economically tied and they have economic restraints then, or in any other hardships, they do not spend, but they just spend when they have an affordability. And the second category we do come across, they just spend when a calamity strikes them to ease the hardships and to let go of the crisis or to escape the crisis they spend in the path of Allah. But they tend to forget. They tend to forget spending in the path of Allah when they are being blessed with the bounties of Allah and when they have an affordability also. So, but the God fearing pious people are those, the inmates of the Jannah will be those who spent in all the conditions and all the states. And the second manner of the pious people is those who will be blessed with the blessings of Jannah is those who do what? Al Kazimin al Ghais. They restrain their anger. I never knew. I never knew till I had gone through this verse of Surah Al Imran that we would also need to restrain our anger to get to Jannah. That containing our, controlling our anger will also be needed for us to land up in Jannah. I did not know that. Only did I realize and when I went through this verse of Surah Al Imran. For entering Jannah, we need to restrain our anger and we need to swallow our anger. al qadimin al ghais means what? Means those people, they swallow their anger. Swallowing their anger means what? Because you know, when you swallow, when you swallow a sip of water or when you swallow any liquid, the person who has swallowed, nobody will know. Nobody will know until the person is seeing swallowing the liquid. Nobody would be able to say that the person has taken a drink. So swallowing anger means what? To, to restrain or control the anger in a manner that it does not even show any signs, no signs of anger, no, no signs in form of an expression on the face, no body movements, no, no nothing by the word of mouth, nothing at all that show that the person was angry or the person was furious by no, by no forms does it show. So this is how we need to restrain anger that the person we are facing just, just, doesn't, just doesn't know and just doesn't realize that we were angry or we were furious. So this is how a person to get Jannah needs to restrain the anger. Self-restraint, how important it is. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam has said that um, Hazrat Abu Huraira uh, said that a person asked Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam that give me some good advice. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam replied, do not lose your temper. The, ma the man kept on asking the question repeatedly and Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam kept on answering the same words, do not lose your temper. So losing temper is what? It is an undesirable habit. And the four traits and the four uh, manners of a uh, hypocrite as have been reported in a uh, tradition of Bukhari and Muslim that Ayatul Munafi Kuruba'a is a hadasa qazaba, is a ahada, is a ahada akhlafa, is a tumana khana. And the last is, is a khasama fajara, that when he fights, when he gets in a fight, he does what? He just simply erupts. He breaks out. So this is just being furious, just being angry. This is an undesirable habit. 
under the influence of anger, a person will not be, will neither be able to uh, follow and care for the divine injunctions and nor for his own gain or loss also. And the person in a state of anger, he becomes a, he becomes a plaything in the hands of the devil and just lets loose. So that is why Prophet Wasallam has instructed us in many words of ahadith how we have to go about to control our anger. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he reports in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet Wasallam said that he is not a wrestler who overpowers his rival, but the wrestler is the one, he who keeps himself under control when roused to anger you know it really needs a lot of willpower and it needs a lot of emotional strength to control the anger and to control uh, to have restraint over the anger similarly hazrat abu zar ghaffari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he reports in musnad ahmad and tirmidhi that prophet sallallahu alaihi said that when any one of you is roused to anger he should sit down if he is standing and if the anger subsides as a result of this well and good, and if it does not, he should lie down. So this is what? A form of a psychological remedy for controlling one's, uh, one's anger. Hazrat Ibn Abbas, Allah, who he has reported in Mustafa Ahmad, the Prophet said, instruct the people in religion, teach religion, and make education easy. Do not make it difficult. And when any one of you is feeling angry, he should keep quiet. And the narrator added that Prophet said these last three words thrice, that when anyone feels angry, he should keep quiet. He repeated this thrice. So staying quiet is also a very effective tool of, um, of restraining anger. Because, you know, when two people indulging in a fight, both go on debating and both go on uh, continuing their fight and their dialogue, then obviously the fight will prolong and there are chances of letting loose with the person's anger but when one of them keeps quiet then obviously the fight also just subsides and it becomes easier for the person to control the anger also has atiya bin orva asadi she uh, reports in uh, uh, has been related uh, in abu daud that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that anger is roused under the influence of shaitan and shaitan has been created from fire and fire is put out with water. So when any one of you is seized with anger, let him perform wudu. So we can perform wudu when we are angry or we can take a bath or we can do what? We can also drink water. And this is the suggestion of the words of Hadith. And similarly, as we learn from this word, uh, from this uh, from this tradition, the Prophet has, uh, has instructed that it is because of shaitan. So making zikr and remembrance of Allah, like saying, A'uzu billahi bin shaitan rajim will also help us contain our anger. Because we know that Prophet ﷺ has told all of us that there are two compartments of the heart. In one is an angel and in the second part is the, is the devil, is shaitan. And when we remember or we make remembrance of Allah, then the shaitan flees. So when we are in a state of fury, what we need to do is we need to glorify Allah. We need to remember Allah. We need to say like, A'uzu billahi minash shaitwan rajim here in a state of fury is the best form of remembrance of Allah because here we are remembering Allah and we are also seeking his protection against shaitan. Or the verses which Allah has mentioned in Quran, Rabbi A'uzu bika min hamazati shayateen wa A'uzu bika Rabbi yahzaruni. If we start reciting these verses, obviously we will get contented. We will get uh, we will get tranquility, as Allah says, Allah bi zikrullahi tatma'inul kulub. And this tranquility and this sakina and this peace of mind will also help us restrain our anger. And this remembrance of Allah will make shaitan flee from there. And this will save us from the attacks of shaitan, which are going to which are going to misguide us to let loose during our anger. And that is, we also see from an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Prophet Sallallahu came across a person who was, who was fighting and he was angry and he was furious that his face had gone red with because of his rage. 
And Prophet Sallallahu looked at him and he said that I know of words. If he recites those, then he will be able to restrain his anger. And then Prophet Sallallahu informed that these words are what? A'uzu billahi minash shaitan rajim so this is another suggestion that we drink water, we make wudu, and we recite these two verses of Quran to, contrain, to restrain our anger. And why should we do this? As has been reported by Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar and Mustad Ahmad, the Prophet said that no one drank a draft superior no one drank a draft superior in the sight of Allah to the draft of anger that has that was drunk with the intention of earning his good player. And what is the reward? What is the reward is what we learn from uh, an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were sitting together that a Bedouin, he came and he started insulting Hazrat Umar Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, and he was abusive and he was ill-mannered. To start with, initially, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, he was um, he was in a total state of um, he was quiet, he was silent, and he just uh, restrained his anger and he just kept quiet. While Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, who kept quiet and he was silent, he noticed that Prophet Wasallam had a smile. He was he had a smile on his face. And uh, but when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, who he could tolerate no longer and he could not uh, stand any longer the abusive manner of that uh, Bedouin, then he started answering back. And he started responding to what he was saying. And then Prophet Sallallahu immediately got up and he left. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq Raziallahu Ta'ala and who was so upset, he thought that Prophet Sallallahu had got angry. So he went after him. And then he also asked the reason why all this happened this way. And Prophet Sallallahu told him that Abu Bakr Siddiq Raziallahu Ta'ala and who, while when you were silent and he was being ill-mannered to you and you were restraining your anger and you were pardoning him, then I was seeing and I was informed that there was an angel by the order of Allah who was standing behind you. And through all the period of your silence and your self-control, this angel was supplicating for you and was seeking forgiveness for you. But when, when you started answering back also, then I saw that the angel left and a devil and a shaitan came there. So that is why I got up and I left. So this is a reward of the person who restrains anger and just keeps control of the anger and does not respond or retaliate uh, to, the, to, the, to the misbehavior that the person is being exposed to. As a Sahal bin Ma'az, Rasulullah Taala, who has reported in Tirmizi and Abu Dawud, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever drinks his anger when he is in a position to quench it, that is, to suppresses the anger solely for the sake of Allah, although he can he can give vent to his feelings and refrains from visiting his wrath upon the person who incurs it, Allah will call him to himself in the presence of everyone on the day of resurrection. And Allah will tell him to choose whichever bride he likes from among the brides of heaven. So this will be the reward of the person who, who does what? Who exhibits self-control and who restrains anger. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that one, if one guards his tongue, if one, any person guards his tongue, Allah will conceal his secrets. If one restrains his anger, Allah will keep his punish, punishment from him on the day of resurrection. And if one makes his excuses to Allah, Allah will accept his excuse. Similarly, Hazrat Ibn Abbas, anhu, he reports in Muslim that Prophet said, there are two habits of yours that are pleasing to Allah. One is forbearance, forbearance, that is not to be overcome with anger. And the other is not to act in a state of hurry. So when somebody uh, infuriates us and when somebody uh, irritates us, then just uh, acting in haste 
and being overcome by our anger and to lose control of ourselves. This is disliked by Allah for all the believers. Now, we do realize that it is somehow very difficult, but it was done by all the companions. It was done by the prophets. And we, uh, there was an incident in the life of Imam Zainul Abidin. He went through all controlling of anger and forgiving and everything. Now, let me um, complete the verse first, that the first uh, manner was that they spent. And the second thing is that they restrain their anger. Now, when they restrain their anger, what do they do? The next thing is they, they pardon the people. They pardon the people after restraining their anger and after controlling their furious feelings. What do they do? They do not build them up. They do not build them up so that one fine morning, the whole the volcano of the anger, it just erupts. No. Instead, they do what? They forgive. They pardon the people who had wronged them. Because why? Because Prophet Sallallahu has told all of us, Forgive if you want to be forgiven. And it is reported in a tradition that one who forgives, Allah will forgive him on the day of judgment. And then after forgiving, what do they do? Allah loves the doers of good. Allah loves the doers of good. That is finally, they do what? They are al muhsineen They control their anger. They control their fury. Then they forgive, they pardon. And then finally, they they do good to the person who had wronged them. This looks like next to impossible. This looks humanly impossible. It looks like an angel. But in the stories of the prophets, in the stories of companions, we do see all this being done. We see all this being done. Imam Zainul Abidin. Imam Zainul Abidin had a slave and she was helping him performing wudu and she was assisting him by pouring the water for wudu. And what happened was that immediately water fell as a splash and all his, all his uh, dress got wet and he was angry and he was furious and he, he raised his hand to hit the slave, the slave woman, he, he raised his hand, but then she started reciting this verse, what caused him in al -ghais? So he dropped his hand and he stopped the, he gave away the intention of hitting her and beating her and punishing her. And then she said, Wa'afina and Nas. And he immediately responded and he said, Okay, I forgive you and I pardon you for what you did. And then she said, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsaneen, that Allah loves the doers of good. And he immediately answered, Okay, fine, I free you for the sake of Allah. So these were the companions. They actually responded. They actually reciprocated to the verses of Quran. And then Imam Bukhari, uh, a person came over and uh, he was uh, abusive and he was, uh, he was um, not respecting him and he was dishonoring Imam Bukhari and he was calling him by bad names. And he was ill-mannered to Imam Bukhari. But Imam Bukhari, he just kept quiet and he was silent and he did not answer back. And the next day, he went to pay him a visit. That person who had been ill-mannered to him the previous day, Imam Bukhari, he went with a gift of a book and he presented him with this gift. And the person, he was so shocked and the person, he was so upset. And he, he, he mentioned that the previous day, I had behaved with you with ill manner and I was bad tempered to you and I was abusive and disrespectful to you. And now you come over visiting, with, uh, visiting me and giving me this gift of a book. Imam Bukhari told him that the gift of the book is because is in lieu of the good deeds which you had transferred in my account while you were being disrespectful and abusive towards me. So this is the self-control and this is the forbearance, the patience and constraining of the anger by an imam and by the companions. And we do come across the behavior and the manner of Hazrat Yaqub salam, Hazrat Yusuf salam in Surah Yusuf also. Hazrat Yusuf salam calling out what? La tasriba alaykum al -yom. There is no accountability for you today. He called out these words of forgiveness, these words of being pardoned, to whom? To his brothers, the brothers who had been jealous, 
who had been hard-hearted, who had planned his murder, who had threw him in the well, because of whom all the hardships he had to face in his life because of their activity, because of their planning. He had been through all these hardships in his life, facing them, what does he come up with? He says, La tasriba alaykumul yaw. So remember, it is not humanly impossible to restrain anger and to forgive and then finally do good to the person who, who, was, who was incurring all this. Prophet Wasallam has been seen to do all this so many times in his life. At the conquest of Makkah, at the conquest of Makkah, Prophet Wasallam forgave whom? Ikrama bin Abu Jahal, the son of Abu Jahal. Hind, Hind who had caused, who has caused the death of Hazrat, Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and her, and who? And then Prophet sallallahu forgave the daughter-in-law of Abu Jahal, Umm Hakim, and there it is Hind, and accompanying, accompanying Hind is Umm Hakim. They walk in after the conquest of Makkah, and Prophet sallallahu says what? Marhaba ya hin, welcome to Islam hin. How patient, what forbearance, how forgiving, and what doing of good deeds. And then Prophet Wasallam pardoned Usman bin Talha. He was, he was the key bearer of haram. And when during his stay in Makkah, Prophet Sallallahu had asked him to open the haram because he wanted to visit inside the haram. Talha Usman bin Talha, he had very, uh, he had very aggressively, he had humiliated Prophet Sallallahu and he had been now Subhanallah very disrespectful, and he had refused to open the open the door of haram. But on the day of conquest of Makkah. Usman bin Talha was called and he was summoned and he was he was like shivering with fear and he he thought that he will be beheaded. But Prophet Wasallam forgave him and he handed him over the keys and he announced that from this day till the day of judgment, the keys will be, the key bearers will be the family of Usman bin Talha. This was, this was forbearance. This was patience. This was restraining of anger. This was pardoning. And this was what? This was sheer and simple goodness with Usman bin Talha. Prophet Sallallahu even pardoned Salamama bin Usan who had planned the murder of Prophet Sallallahu On the day of conquest of Makkah, standing in front of him, were those who had caused, who had caused as a Zainab ta'ala and had to fall from the she camel when she was migrating towards Medina and she was expecting and it led to her abortion and miscarriage. Even Prophet Sallallahu forgave all of them. No personal revenge, total control of anger, pardoning everyone. This was out of sheer goodness and kindness and forgiveness. This is the manner of whom Regarding whom we have been instructed in Surah Ahzab, Laqad kana lakum fi Rasulullahi uswatun hasanatun. The model of excellence is the model of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was forbearing, who was patient, who would restrain anger, who would forgive and pardon, and who would then do what? Do kindness and do goodness to those who were bad to him, who had wronged him. And then the remaining manners of those who are pious and who will be blessed with Jannah and those who when they commit an immorality, who when they commit immorality or wrong themselves by transgression, they remember Allah and they seek forgiveness for their sins. Who can forgive sins except Allah and who do not persist in what they have done while they know those, those their reward is forgiveness from their lords and gardens beneath which rivers flow in paradise, wherein they will abide eternally. And excellent is the reward of the righteous workers. So the final uh, trait of the fifth trait of the people of Jannah and the God-fearing pious people is what? That they turn towards Allah. When they commit sin, when they commit sin, they do what? They turn towards Allah. Remember to err is human. As Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been reported that he said, 
Kullu bani adama khattan, khairul khata'ina tawwabun. All the human beings, all the sons of Adam alayhi salam, they are, they are, they are but supposed to commit sins. It is a human instinct, they will err. But the best of those who err or commit sins are whom? Who repent, who repent, who seek forgiveness. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatwakhireen. So, the proper the behavior of those inmates of Jannah is that when they commit a sin, they fear Allah, they turn towards Allah seeking forgiveness and repenting for their sins. And they stubbornly and obstinately, they do not stick on to the sin and they do not carry on justifying or covering up their wrongdoings and sins. Instead, they confess, they accept, they confess, they regret, they repent, they seek forgiveness and they make promises and they ask for help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify themselves, to reform themselves, and to improve themselves. Similar situations as yours have passed on before you. So proceed throughout the earth and observe how was the end of those who denied. This Quran is a clear statement to all the people and a guidance and instruction for those conscious of Allah. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. So do not weaken and do not grieve and you will be superior if you are the true believers. Now in these verses and the following verses also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to console the companions. After they had suffered the heavy loss of the battle of Uhud, 70 of the Muslims, they were martyred, 70 Mujahideen, they were seriously injured and wounded, many women, they were widowed, many children were, were orphaned, so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consoling them that this was just a trial. It was just a trial and ultimately the superiority and victory will be yours provided when, provided if you are the believers, you obey Allah and you are obedient to Allah and Prophet Sallallahu then victory will finally be, will, will be with you. Verse number 140, if a wound should touch you, there has already touched the opposing people a wound similar to it. So Allah is con uh, consoling the companions, telling that if this year 70 of you have been martyred, so just the previous year in the battle of Badr, you happened to kill 70 of them also. So you inflicted on them a similar loss the previous year. So now, previous year, you inflicted a loss on them, and this year, as a trial, you have been inflicted by a similar trial also. So if, you, if a wound should touch you, there has already touched the opposing people a wound similar to it. And these days of varying condition, these days of varying conditions, we alternate among the people so that Allah may make evident those who believe and may take himself from among you martyrs. And Allah does not like the wrongdoers. So Allah is clearly explaining that this is what? This is a period of trial. And Allah wants to check out the believers from the disbelievers. And Allah wants to bless some of you with the blessings and with the rewards of of what Allah, Allah, Allah blesses the martyrs, 141, and that Allah may purify the believers through trials and destroy the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that why are they being put into trial? Because Allah wants to differentiate between the believers and the non-believers, the obedience and the disobedience. Verse 142, or do you think that you will enter paradise while Allah has not yet made evident those of you who fight in his cause and made evident those who were steadfast. So in this verse, Allah is explaining that to make a decision for whom he will be blessing with the rewards of Jannah, you have been put into this trial. And you had certainly wished for martyrdom before you encountered it, and you have now seen it before you while you were looking on. 
Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die or to be killed, would you turn back on your heels to unbelief? And he who turns back on his heels will never harm Allah at all, but Allah will reward the grateful. Now, this is being said in this verse because the companions, when they had received the rumor that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had passed away, they had this, they had received the news of martyrdom of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had been demoralized and they had left the battlefield. So here Allah says, that were you fighting for the cause of Allah? Were you fighting for the sake of Allah? Or were you fighting for the sake of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So they have been giving, they have been given a jolting and they have been uh, highlighted as to what wrong they did during the battle of Ohad. And it is not, it is not possible for one to die except by the permission of Allah at a decree determined. And whoever desires the reward of this world, we will give him thereof. And whoever desires the reward of hereafter, we will give him thereof. And we will reward the grateful. Rabbi Aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ja'alni saburan wa ja'alni shakura wa ja'alni fi aini saqira wa fi a'yunin nasi qabira. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina azab al-nar. Verse 146, and how many a prophet they fought and with him fought many religious scholars, but they never lost assurance due to what afflicted them in the cause of Allah, nor did they weaken or submit. And Allah loves the steadfast. Now in this verse, the people of Medina, all the people of Medina, and even we, all the followers of the Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu we are being told, and the companions of Prophet Sallallahu they are being reassured, telling them that you are not the first group of people who are being exposed to all the trials of battles or the trials of being defeated and of, uh, of finding hardships and crises of battles. You are not the first group of people who are being exposed to all these trials. The followers of the previous prophets also, they were subjected to such trials of battles and hardships and crises also. How did they behave? How did they behave and what behavior they exhibited that Allah liked? They were what? Allah says, Fama wahinu. They were not demoralized. They were not disappointed. They were not disheartened or dejected. And then Allah says, Wama zurafu. They, they were not weakened. And then Wama staqanu. they did not lose power. <coughs> they did not lose power. They did not lose their perseverance and willpower. And Wama staqanu means they did not submit. They did not submit or surrender to the enemies. They did not reconcile. They did not compromise with the enemies out of the fear of the enemy. So, and they were steadfast and they were perseverance in the obedient and in the reliance of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing, showing the companions and all of us also the behavior of the followers, which Allah approved, which Allah liked, which pleased Allah is guiding all of us to adopt the similar manner, not to be dejected, not to be disappointed, not to lose heart, not to, uh, not to weaken out, not to submit or surrender to the enemy, but to stay steadfast and perseverant in the obedience of Allah. And their words were, the words of all those followers, the behavior which Allah has liked, what did they do? Their words were not, but they said, our Lord, forgive us our sins and the excess committed in our affairs and plant firmly our feet and give us victory over the disbelieving people. So what else did the believer, the, the followers of the previous prophets do, which Allah liked? They did was, they did remembrance. 
they remembered Allah. They glorified and exalted Allah. And remembering Allah, they returned towards Allah, supplicating. Supplicating to Allah for victory, for steadfastness, for perseverance of faith and belief. And they returned towards Allah, seeking forgiveness. So this is the behavior. Remember, seeking forgiveness and supplicating to Allah and remembering Allah, glorifying Allah is what? All these are, they are the arms, they are the ammunition, they are the strength of the mujahideen for fighting in the cause of Allah. So what happened to them? These followers of the previous prophets who exhibited all this behavior and who returned to Allah seeking forgiveness and supplicating for his help. What happened to such followers? What happened to them? You know what? People in routine, they would have labeled them as fanatics. They would have been called as fanatics and maniacs. They, would, they must have been called as people who are mentally sick, insane to behave like this. Now, what happened to these fanatics? Were they defeated? Were they defeated by their powerful enemies? No, what happened was Allah gave them the reward of this world and the good reward of hereafter. And Allah loves the doers of good. So what happened is they received with the will of Allah the worldly bounties of success and they were rewarded in hereafter also. O you who have believed, if you obey those who disbelieve, they will turn you back on your heels and you will then become losers. But Allah is your protector and he is the best of helpers. We will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve for what they have associated with Allah or which he had not sent down any authority and their refuge will be the fire and wretched is the residence of the wrongdoers. And Allah had certainly fulfilled his promise to you. Allah had certainly fulfilled his promise to you when you were killing the enemy by his permission until the time when you lost courage and fell to disputing about the order given by Prophet wasallam and disobeyed after he had shown you that which you love. Among you are some who desire this world, and among you are some who desire the hereafter. Then he turned you back from them, defeated that he might test you, and he has already forgiven you, and Allah is the possessor of bounty for the believers. Now, in this verse 152, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained the exact state of affairs with the underlying reasons. Now, this is being done, why? Because after the losses, the Muslims had to suffer in the battle of Uhud. The hypocrites of Medina, they started criticizing. And they started saying that the promises made by Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had not been fulfilled. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had promised victory. Muslims had been promised victory with the help of Allah. But on the contrary, the Muslims, they had to suffer such heavy physical and monetary losses. Now to answer all this and to rectify any suspicion in the hearts of believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave all this explanation. Allah said that as long, as long as in the first part of the battle, as long the Muslims, they obeyed. They obeyed Allah and they stayed patient and they relied. They relied on the help of Allah, then Allah helped them. And they were victorious. As we learn from the traditions that the companions did report that we saw that the army of the Quraysh, they were fleeing back from the battlefield. And we saw that the ladies of the Quraysh, they were also running and they were running in terror and they were raising their garments to expose their legs. So initially, with the help of Allah, the Muslims were victorious when their behavior was what Allah had disliked and what Allah had ordered and what Allah had enjoined and what Allah wanted them the way to behave. They were they were obedient, they were patient, they were reliant. Then with the help of Allah, victory, victory came to them. But when? But when they out of the love of the riches and the wealth, 
they had indulged in disobedience of Allah and his prophet, then help of Allah and his blessings were withdrawn and heavy losses were inflicted on them. And why were these heavy losses inflicted on them? Were well, because of their own disobedience, because of their own lack of patience and obedience were they to face these heavy losses. So that is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly explained in these verses, highlighting the disobedience and the incorrect conduct of the of the companions. Uh, the, Allah further explains in verse 153, remember, remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside at anyone while the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was calling you from behind. What was he calling out? He was saying, when he was left all by himself unprotected in the battlefield. So Allah repaid you with distresses upon distress, so you would not grieve for that which had escaped you of victory and spoils of war, or for that which had befallen you of injury and death. And Allah is fully acquainted with what you do. So the disobedience and the incorrect conduct is further being highlighted and explained. That is, when Prophet Sallallahu was injured and he was unsafe and he was calling for protection, they had failed to respond. So this verse not only highlights the condition of the battlefield of Uhud, instead of that to all the Muslims, it is not just making comment and debating on the situation of the people of Medina, but to all the Muslims of all the times of all the countries, it points out the underlying causes of crises of trials and hardships. And as today, we do realize that the Muslim Ummah at all levels is going through a very, very difficult time, hard times. The Muslims are being persecuted. The Muslims are exposed to all forms of physical, social, psychological, emotional crises of all sorts. What we need to analyze today is, and what we need to realize today is, that this, all these trials, these persecutions of the Ummah today are why? Because of our own disobedient behaviors, because of our own transgressions. And what we need to do at, at all levels of Ummah, at all levels of all the Muslim countries, we need to do is that we need to analyze. We need to analyze and we need to confess. We need to confess at all levels what we have been disobeying Quran and Hadith, indulging in the love of the world. We've not been bothered about protection of protection of the laws of Quran, about teaching, preaching, implementation of Quran. We have just, we have just been forgetful. We've just not been bothered about this duty of ours, which has been assigned to us, calling us kuntum khaira ummatin. We need to accept all this. We need to seek forgiveness with promises of rectification, with promises of reforming ourselves with the help of Allah and with promising of leaving all our follies and turning as obedient servants of Allah, as submitting, surrendering servants of Allah, working for the cause of Dawa, working for the cause of protection of the laws of Allah, working for the cause of implementation of the rules and regulations of Allah on the land of Allah. Then after distress, he sent down upon you security in the form of drowsiness, overcoming a faction of you, while another faction worried about themselves, thinking of Allah other than the truth, the thought of ignorance, saying, is there anything for us to have done in this matter? So in this verse, in the starting part, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that after the Muslims were put into trial and they were giving a jolting to make them realize how disobedient they had been out of the love of, uh, out because of the love of uh, money and the love of riches, they've been given a jolting. But then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
made them send them down drowsiness and uh, companions themselves, they report that we all were drowsy and we were raising our hands and arms with our swords, but our hands would fall back down and we were all drowsy and we were blessed with tranquility from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down angels to fight for the Muslims and the Muslims were then protected. And then the other faction who said was the, the, uh, the hypocrites. They said, is there anything for us to have done in this matter? Say, indeed, the matter belongs completely to Allah. They conceal within themselves what they were not revealed to you. They say, if there was anything we could have done in this matter, some of us would not have been killed right here. So it was the hypocrites. They started saying that if you had accepted our suggestion of staying back in Medina and fighting and facing the, uh, the enemies from within the city, you had taken our suggestions, then all this would not have happened. So their behavior has been mentioned and they are being answered. They say that if there was anything we could have done in the matter, some of us would not have been killed right here. Say, even if you had been inside your houses, those decreed to be killed would have come out to their deathbeds. It was so that Almighty Allah might test what is in your breasts and purify what is in your hearts. And Allah is knowing of that within the breasts. Indeed, those of you who turned back on that day, the two armies met, it was shaitan who caused them to slip because of some blame they had earned. This was what, this is what, this is the comment of Allah and the punishment of the hypocrites who are led by Abdullah bin Ubay, uh, a group of 250 people they had went back to Medina. But Allah has already forgiven them. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and forbearing. O oh, you who have believed, do not be like those who disbelieved and say about their brothers when they traveled through the land or went out to fight. If they had been with us, they would not have died or would not have been killed. So Allah makes that misconception a regret within their hearts. And it is Allah who gives life and causes death. And Allah is seeing of what you do. In this verse, what we learn is that in the life of a believer, in the life of a Muslim, there are no regrets. There are no regrets, ifs and buts about the past. About the past, the believer does not regret and saying something like that, I wish I had not done this because of which I suffered. I wish I had not gone there because of which something wrong happened to me. Remember, a believer who has faith in fate and decree does not regret in the happenings of the past. The only relationship, the only relationship of the believer with the past is, is his accountability of his deeds in the past of confession of his sins in the past, and then repenting and seeking forgiveness for the sins in the past. And then his behavior and relationship in the present is to work to eradicate the sins, to rectify the disobediences, and to reform and improve himself in the present. And for the future, it is what? The fear of hereafter and working for the hereafter. And if you are killed in the cause of Allah or you die, then forgiveness from Allah and mercy are better than whatever you accumulate in this world. And whether you die or are killed unto Allah, you will be gathered. So by the mercy from Allah, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult them in the matter. And when you have decided, then rely upon Allah. Indeed, Allah loves those who rely upon them. In this verse, 159, Allah has explained the manner and the traits of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a leader. 
as a leader, as the head of state, as an army chief, as the chief justice. These were all the designations and posts of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this verse explains the manner of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a leader. The verse itself very, very comprehensively is providing to us the best training for the head of department. We, we do see people going and um, going and attending courses for leadership training and man management training courses. This verse itself is the most comprehensive leader training leadership training course. And this very comprehensively provides a man management training course. The head of the department, the leader of a group needs to be what? Needs to be kind, merciful, soft-hearted, lenient, patient, behaving with forbearance, should, should not be rude and harsh, bad and ill-tempered, and should not be harsh in his language and conversation, should have forbearance and patience, should be pardoning, forgiving, and then should do what? Shavir Humfil Amr should make consultation, should be seeing counseling his juniors and subordinates. This is an order of Quran. Counseling with the subordinates, counseling with the juniors is what? It is an order of Quran and it is a sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, this counseling and making consultation with the subordinates, it is, it is a very useful thing. And it is very important and it brings very positive results and outcomes. Because you know, when all the companions, when they are involved in a counseling and consultation is made with them, they feel as if they have been respected and they have been given importance. Rather than just, just dictating and announcing a decision that, okay, like a dictator, the head of the department or the leader just comes one fine morning and announcing, okay, fine, as a dictator, I announce this will happen and so and so and such and such will be doing this. And this is just a simple announcement and a dictation. Concentration, contrary to that, it creates a positive environment, a feeling of involvement, a feeling of participation. And all the members, they feel as if they have been involved. And then what happens is they take it up as, as their own project and they collectively work to make it a success. And plus, another thing is more minds thinking, more minds thinking, more suggestions coming from sincere people. They will definitely come up with useful suggestions and positive ideas and um, things will also work out in a better way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has suggested here the leaders of uh, any head of department or any leader to equip themselves with all these qualities and traits. If Allah should aid you, no one can overcome you. But if he should forsake you, who is there who can aid you after him? And upon Allah, let the believers rely. It is not attributable to any prophet that he would act unfaithfully in regard to war booty. And whoever betrays taking unlawfully will come with what he took on the day of resurrection. Then will every soul be fully compensated for what it earned and they will not be wronged. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that it is not It is not attributable for any prophet to act unfaithfully regarding the war of booty. Now, why is this being said is that because some of the people who had been appointed as archers, as guards of the mountain pass, they had developed a feeling and a fear that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will na'uzu billah, summa na'uzu billah min zalik. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam might also be unfair and let the people collecting the booty keep it and they will be deprived of their lawful share. So it is being clarified here that regarding Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this behavior of being unfair or not being just is simply not attributable. It is unattributable to assume or to have any thought or any assumption of the sort. 
Similarly, this verse is also revealed regarding an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was accompanied with his companions and there he received a gift sent to him by Hazrat Ali Raziallahu Ta'ala and who, who had who was visiting Iraq. Hazrat Ali Raziallahu Ta'ala and who had sent him four raw pieces of gold as in the form of a gold ore, a rock of four, four rocks of raw gold. They were in a leather pocket and they were sent by Hazrat Ali Raziallahu Ta'ala and who as a gift to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was his own personal gift sent to him by his son-in-law. It was his personal belonging. It was not a booty. It was not anything of the Baytul Mal. It was just a personal belonging of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his personal gift. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked around and he distributed these to few of his companions would, whom he thought were deserving. So there was a person in the, in the gathering, he got up. And he very aggressively, and he now Zubillah, very disrespecting Prophet Sallallahu he called out that, oh, Prophet Sallallahu you fear Allah. Immediately, Prophet Sallallahu was very, uh, he constrained, he restrained his anger, and he was in a very, uh, in a, a forbearing manner, he answered back that, am I not the most God-fearing among all of you? And then he again called back very loud and very disrespectful manner, now Zubillah, he said, that, O oh, Prophet Sallallahu be just. Fear Allah and be just. And then Prophet Sallallahu again added that, am I not the most fear among all of you? But he still stuck up to the way he was behaving and he just jerked aggressively his head and he left the gathering stamping his feet very aggressively. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was overwhelmed and he was very angry and he just stood up and he asked Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that if you allow me, I behead him. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam stopped him and he said that no people would say that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam started, started beheading people from his own gatherings and his own companions. But at the same time, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also informed that very soon, very soon in his offsprings and in his progenies, there will be people who will just recite and listen to the Quran, will just enjoy, will just enjoy listening to the recitation of Quran, but nothing will enter their souls. Nothing will lower down their throats, will enter their souls, and they will, they will leave religion just like an arrow leaves its place. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. So regarding this uh, event, this verse was revealed. So is the one who pursues the player of Allah like the one who brings upon himself the anger of Allah and whose refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. They are wearing degrees in the sight of Allah and Allah is seeing of whatever they do. Certainly did Allah confer great favor upon the believers when he sent among them a messenger from themselves, doing what? Reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they had been before in manifest error. In this verse number 164, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained what has been explained in similar verses of Quran other than this also. Four times in Quran has similar verses been revealed twice in Surah Al-Baqarah, once in Surah Al-Imran, this verse 164, and once in Surah Juma. In these four verses, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted the four steps, the four essential steps adopted by Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the teaching and for the preaching of the Quran and Hadith. And for the implementation, the four steps of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first being the recitation of the verses of Quran, followed by the teaching and explaining the messages of these verses and then by actually by his hadith and by his sunnah teaching them and training them with the hikmah and with the wisdom and purifying and training them and reforming them so these were the four steps 
the four steps which led to the greatest ever human revolution on this earth the biggest ever revolution which changed the minds which changed the mindsets the society the customs the norms of the arab society were revolutionarily changed because of these four steps being conducted by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have been mentioned four times in quran why is it that when a single disaster struck you on the day of ohod although you had struck the enemy in the battle of badr with one twice as great you said from where is this say it is from yourselves indeed allah is over all things competent and what struck you on the day the two armies met was by the permission of allah that he might make evident the true believers and that he might make evident those who are hypocrites for it was said to them come fight in the way of allah or at least defend they said if we had known there would be fighting we would have followed you they were nearer to disbelieve that day than to faith saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts and allah is more knowing of what they conceal those who said about their brothers while sitting at home if they had obeyed us what was who was saying all this allah has quoted what the hypocrites were saying regarding the mujahideen and the martyrs if they had obeyed us they would not have been killed say then prevent death from yourselves if you should be truthful that is if you are so clever you are so sharp that your plannings can deter or can save people from dying then plan plan saving yourselves from death and never think of those who have been killed in the cause of allah as dead rather they are alive with their lord receiving provisions the martyrs in the path of allah they are not dead allah says in quran wala taqulu li man yaqtulu fi sabili allah amwatun bal ahya'un walakin la tash'urun that do not announce that all those who lay down their lives in the path of allah for the cause fighting for the sake of allah in the path of jihad do not call them that they have been killed they are not dead they are alive and how are they alive it has been reported in a tradition that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the spirits of all the martyrs they reside in the form of beautiful green birds who go about in the in the in the in all the uh, gardens of jannah and they fly during the day they fly in the gardens of jannah and they get their provisions from the gardens of jannah and when the night falls these birds they reside in the beautiful lamps which are hanging by the throne of allah so the martyrs they should not be considered as dead they are alive as according to the words of the verses of quran and by the traditions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how much allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approves of and how excellent is martyrdom Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the first drop of blood of the martyr when it falls all the sins are forgiven so the blood of martyrdom is a source of what atonement of all the sins of the life of the person and how much does the person suffer as if just pricking by a needle and all the sins are forgiven allahumma arzuqna shahadatan fi sabilik allahumma arzuqna shahadatan fi sabilik and what are the martyrs they rejoicing in rejoicing rejoicing in what allah has bestowed upon them of his bounty and they receive good tidings about those to be martyred after them who have not yet joined them and that there will be no fear concerning them nor will they grieve they receive good tidings of favor from allah and bounty and bounty and of the fact that allah does not allow the reward of the believers to be lost they believe those believers who responded to allah and the messenger after injury had struck them for those who did good among them and feared allah is a great reward those to whom hypocrites said indeed the people have gathered against you so fear them but it merely increased them in faith and they said what 
Hasbunallah, ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah and he is the best disposer of affairs. Now what Allah is mentioning here is that when despite inflicting heavy losses to the Muslim army, what happened is that when the Quraysh army, despite the fact that they had uh, inflicted heavy losses to the Muslim army, the Meccan army left. Then they stopped after a few miles and Abu Sufyan uh, started reconsidering attacking again because they knew that actually they were victorious and the Muslims, they had defeated them. So what happened when Prophet وسلم, he reached Medina and um, all the 70 Muslims being martyred and 70 people being injured, they, they just entered their homes. The, the army, the people, the soldiers, the Mujahideen, they had just entered their homes and they had not even rested or they had not even um, truly melt their, their families, their wives and their children, that Prophet Sallallahu was given a revolution that Abu Sufyan was started, uh, was, uh, was reconsidering attacking Medina again. So there and then Prophet Sallallahu when he got the news, that uh, Abu Sufyan had had intentions of uh, attacking again. Then there and then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recalled all the Mujahideen for, for fight and for battle again. What a remarkable obedience was exhibited by the companions. All of them, all of them injured, wounded, exhausted, not even having met their families after their return, all of the companions, they were like labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. All the companions returned and gathered for jihad. And it was this time that the hypocrites, they were, they were trying to deter them. And they were saying that even bigger armies have gathered and they're going to attack, make an even bigger attack with a bigger army. But those who believed, and those who were obedient, they, they said, Hasbunallah. They were still obedient, they were still patient, and they were still reliant on Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning and is mentioning and encouraging and talking about them and their behaviors. So what happened with them is so they returned with the favor from Allah and bounty and no harm having touched them. And they pursued the player of Allah and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. That is only shaitan who frightens you of his supporters. So fear them not, but fear me if you are indeed believers. And do not be grieved by those who hasten into disbelief. Indeed, they will never harm Allah at all. Allah intends that he should give them no share in hereafter and for them is a great punishment. Indeed, those who purchase disbelief in exchange of faith will never will they harm Allah at all and for them is a painful punishment. Let not those, let not those who disbelieve ever think that because we extended their time of enjoyment, it is better for them. We only extended it for them so that they may increase in sin and for them is a humiliating punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from this humiliating punishment of the day of judgment. Allah would not leave the believers. Allah would not leave the believers in that state you are in presently until he separates the evil from good, nor would Allah reveal to you the unseen. But instead, Allah chooses of his messengers whom he wills. So believe in Allah and his messengers. And if you believe and fear him, then for you is a great reward. And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty ever think that this greed is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse number 118 is definitely strongly condemned greed and miserliness. Allah says, let them not think who are greedy that this is better for them. Rather, it is what this greed and this being stingy and this being miserly is what it is worse for them. How worse it is, this will end up with what? Their next 
will be encircled by what they withheld on the day of resurrection. And to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth. And Allah with what you do is fully acquainted. Allah all acquainted of all the greed, of all the miserness and all the stingy behavior is here mentioning about their punishment and is condemning and refuting this behavior. Being miserly, being stingy is not the attitude of a, of a believer. Prophet Wasallam said that a believer cannot be a miser. A believer cannot be a miser. A believer will be spending, spending in the path of Allah, will be making charity in the path of Allah. So he cannot be miser. He cannot be a stingy person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is clearly mentioning the punishment of a miser. Is saying that they, their necks will be, will be encircled by bands on the day of judgment. What bands these are have been explained by the words of Prophet Sallallahu that on the day of judgment, all those who will not spend in the path of Allah, they will be made what? They will be, they will be encircling their necks in the form of a bald snake, in the form of a bald snake with two black spots on its eyes, and it will hold their mouths, and it will tear the corners of their mouths and will say, Ana maluka, ana kanzuka, that I am your wealth, that I am your hoarded wealth you used to hold, and you did not make charity in the path of Allah. And here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they will be, they will be punished. Similarly, Allah says in the verse of Surah at tawbah that all those, Wallazina, verse number 34, 35 of Surah Tawbah, Allah says, Wallazina yaknizuna dhahaba walfizata, wala yunfikuna ha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that all those who lay triers, who lay hold triers of gold and silver and do not spend them for the sake of Allah, give them the glad tidings of grievous sufferings. Give them the glad tidings of grievous sufferings and what the grievous sufferings are, that on the day of judgment, the hoarded gold and silver, this will be heated in the hell fire and their foreheads and their sides and their backs will be branded with it. And then they will be what? They will be said, this is the trier you laid for yourself. Taste the evil of your hoarded triers. So this is how they will be punished on the day of judgment. All those who, who hoarded their wealth and did not pay, did not make charity or did not pay the zakat. In a detailed, in a detailed tradition, Prophet ﷺ has explained the punishment for all these people. Prophet ﷺ has said that on the day of judgment, all those people who will not have paid their zakat, what will happen is that they will be, they will be made to lie down with their faces on the ground on the day of judgment, and all this gold and silver. This will be brought in forms of slates and place, and it will be heated on top of the hell fire. And then their, their backs will be branded. And when these slates will get cold, then what will happen is that they will be, it will be heated again. And then they will be stamped again with all, and this will continue for 1000 years till the accountability of people will take place and the people will, will take their places in hell or in Jannah. And then all those who had not paid the zakat for the camels, the, they will also be made to lie with their faces down on the ground on the day of judgment. And these camels will come. They will be much, much weighty than they are in this worldly life. And they will crush them with their feet and they will bite them. And these people, they will howl. And this will continue till the judgment will be made and the people will find their way towards Jannah or hellfire. And all those who had not paid the zakat for their goats, the goats will also come and they will trample them 
and they will crush them with their hoops and they will they will tear them with their horns and they will shriek and they will howl and this will continue for 1000 years till the accountability will be done and the people will take their take their route towards the towards the hellfire or towards jannah so this will be the punishment of all those who have been misers in their life who have been misers in their life so what actually is miserliness what actually is being stingy is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed a person, he has bounties of Allah, he has bounties of Allah, blessings of Allah, he has wealth, he has riches. He has all the wealth, he has all the riches. But despite the fact that he is wealthy and he is in a state of affluence, he has wealthy positions and riches, despite the fact the person does not spend, the person does not spend on what is permissible, what is allowed, what is halal to spend on. And in fact, it is wanted that the person spends on that thing. Even then the person does not spend on those things. Then this is being miserly. This is being stingy despite being wealthy and affluent. It can be, the stinginess can be regarding the rights of the fellow beings, or it can be regarding the rights of Allah. For example, for the rights of fellow beings, a man can afford, but still does not spend on the, for, for the family, like feeding, clothing, education, health, does not spend on that also. Although Hadith does teach us that words of tradition are, that Prophet said that there is a dirham, which you spend for charity. There is the dirham which you spend for your slave. And there is a dirham which you spend for your family or for yourself. The best dirham is that which you spend for yourself and your family. And Prophet has taught all of us that when a husband feeds his wife or gives a gift to his wife, then this is what? This is like one of the best sadhakas he is making. This is one of the best charity he spends. And similarly, when a, when a person spends on his, on his family for their, for their worldly requirements and basic amenities and necessities of life, then this is what? This is like he is spending charity and he will be rewarded like charity. So if a person, if a person is blessed and he is wealthy and he is affluent and despite of the fact he's not doing all this, it is a duty for the father to do all this or for her husband to do all this, he is being miserly. He is being stingy. And uh, as Allah says in Quran, that let the bounties of the sustainers speak. Let the people know that you are being blessed by the bounties. And there's an incident in the life of Prophet ﷺ that he saw a person whose clothes were all filthy and, her, and, and his hair, head, hair were all messed up, filthy clothes and messed up hair. And Prophet ﷺ, when he saw him, he, he, he inquired that is he non-affording, that is he poor? And the companions told him that no, he was he is a wealthy person, he is affluent. And then Prophet said that his condition, his condition should speak of his economic status. And that is exactly what Allah says. So it means that we need to spend on our due due worldly necessities. And if a person is not doing that, the person is being stingy and the person is being miserly. But basically what the verse is commenting here is the person being miserly and not spending charity or not spending for the obligatory zakat, not spending despite the fact that he has the nisab, but does not spend the obligatory zakat and does not spend in the path of Allah, this is the punishment mentioned for this person. By the verses and by the traditions I have mentioned is the punishment for this person. And similarly, we also learn by a tradition that Prophet said that every morning, every morning and every evening, two angels supplicate in the heavens and they say that oh allah oh allah destroy the wealth of all those who do not spend in the path of allah and bless and bless and multiply the wealth of all those who spend in the path of allah and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has explained 
swearing by Allah, explained to all who generally believe that spending in the, uh, in the path of Allah will lead to what? With our money and wealth being depleted. Prophet ﷺ said, biyadihi nafsi, By the word of Allah, by the name of whom holds my life, wealth does not decrease by spending in the path of Allah, and respect and status does not decrease by forgiving. Rather, Allah raises the rags of the person who, who forgives. Allah has certainly heard the statement of those Jews who said, indeed, Allah is poor while we are rich. This is a criticism, Na'uzubillah, with the Jews used to make when they were asked to spend charity in the path of Allah and feed the poor and clothe those who do not have clothes. So they used to say that Allah is poor while we are rich. We will record what they said and their killing of the prophets without right and will say, taste the punishment of the burning fire. That is for what your hands have put forth and because Allah is not ever unjust to his servants. They are those who say, indeed, Allah has taken our promise not to believe any messenger until he brings us an offering which fire from the heaven will consume. Say, there have come to you messengers before me with clear proofs and even that of which you speak. So why did you kill them if you should be truthful? So the people of the book to justify themselves why they were not believing in Quran and in the prophethood of Prophet wasallam, they came out with this illogical excuse. And they said that if only Prophet ﷺ would make a sacrifice which would be consumed by a fire from heaven. Because, you know, uh, in the time of Bani Israel, this was a manner. That when the people or when the prophets even, they made a sacrifice of an animal, then a fire used to come from the heaven and used to consume the sacrificed animal. And this was a proof that the sacrifice had been accepted by Allah. So the Jews and uh, uh, and the Christians they had uh, they 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 used to say that if Prophet Sallallahu showed them this form of a sacrifice which was taken up by the fire, then only will we be accepting his prophethood. So Allah says that there were prophets who were showing you this miracle. Then why did you fail to accept their prophethood in their lives? Then if they deny you, so were messengers denied before you who brought clear proofs and written ordinances and the enlightening scripture, every soul will taste death and you will only be given your full compensation on the day of resurrection. So he who is drawn away from fire and admitted to paradise has attained his desire. And what is the life of this world except the enjoyment of delusion? Allah save us all from these deluding enjoyments. Allahumma a'inni ala ghamaratil maut wa sakaratil maut. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa khusni ibadatik. Rabbi ibni li aindaka baitan fil janna. Rabbi ibni li aindaka baitan fil janna. You surely will be tested in your positions and in your cells, and you will surely hear from those who were given the scripture before you and from those who associate others with Allah much abuse. But if you are patient and fear Allah, indeed, that is of the matter worthy of determination. And mention when Allah took a covenant from those who were given the scripture saying, you must make it clear to the people and not conceal it. But they threw it away behind their backs and exchanged it for a small price and wretched is that which they purchase. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as is previously explained, that all the mankind was created and presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where they made a pledge of the sustainer, Alastu bi rabbikum, and they replied, What qalu bala? After all this, the prophets, directly the prophets and indirectly all their followers, they were made to take a pledge that if any prophet 
who succeeded their prophet, then they will believe the succeeding prophet. And not only will they believe in them, they will obey them and they will help them. So this has this verse has been sent as uh, as an uh, as a reminder. This verse has been sent as a reminder for the Jews and the Christians regarding the pact or regarding the pledge they had made regarding Prophet Sallallahu and the Quran, which they were they were failing to uh, complete the pledge and they were not believing in Prophet Sallallahu and the Quran. And never think that those who rejoice in what they have perpetrated and liked to be praised for what they did not do, never think them to be in safety from the punishment and for them is a painful punishment. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and Allah is over all things competent. Verse number 190. Indeed, in the criterion of heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day are signs for those of understanding. From here are starting the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Imran as proven by the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding the excellence of these last 10 verses, we learn that these were the verses which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite when he used to come, when he used to wake up for the Salatul Tahajjud. It has been reported by Hazrat uh, Abdullah bin Abbas, Rasulullahu Ta'ala, and who in Bukhari, when he was reciting, uh, when he was residing in uh, the house or the apartment of his aunt, and he saw what Prophet Sallallahu did when he got up for the Salat of the Hajjud. He narrates that uh, Prophet Sallallahu he, he got up and he uh, recited a few verses and then he did wudu and then he started offering the Salah of the Hajjud. What did he recite? We learn from these uh, traditions is that when he got up for the Salat of the Hajjud, he used to recite, first of all, he used to recite the supplication for waking up and then 10 times each would he recite Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Astaghfirullah, and then the recitation of uh, the glorifying uh, uh, verses of Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa Allahu Akbar, and then la ilaha illallah, wa akhtahu la sharika lahu, wa lahu al-hukmu, wa lahu al-hamdu, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has also been mentioned, and he used to do himself also, that he mentioned that when somebody recites, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa Allahu Akbar, that he glorifies and exalts Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and then he says, Allahumma gfir li, or Allahumma gfir lana, that is, he seeks forgiveness, then he is, all the sins are forgiven. And then after reciting all this, he used to recite these 10 verses of Surah Al-Imran also. So here in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the traits and the manners of whom Ulul Al-Bab, Ulul Al-Bab being the people of wisdom, the people of understanding and the knowledgeable bondsmen. <coughs> So who the Ulul Albab are and how do they behave and what do they go about doing in their daily lives is Alladheena yathqaroon Allah qiyaman wa qa'udan wa ala junubihim. Ulul Albab are those who remember Allah while standing or sitting or lying on their sides. So this part of the verse shows what? That it is the knowledgeable bondsman of Allah who remember Allah. So it is showing what? The excellence of remembrance of Allah. Not only that, it also shows how and what is the manner of excellence of the remembrance of Allah for the bondsman. The remembrance of Allah, zikr in all form can be done in all forms, sitting, standing, and lying. So how does a believer remember Allah, glorify Allah, exalt his Lord is? He does not have to quit the worldly activities and sit aside for a specific time, for a specific duration to exalt and glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a few words of tasbihat. No, what we need to do is 
that as obedient servants of Allah, we remember to we need to remember Allah in our hearts. The heart has to be supple with the remembrance of Allah, and the tongue has to be supple with the with the remembrance of Allah, with the glorification for Allah. And we are walking around, cooking, baking, cooking, baking, dusting, sweeping, driving all parts of the body, serving the mankind performing our duties, paying the rights of others and paying the rights of Allah and paying the rights of the bondsmen. But concurrently, at the same time, the tongue is supple with the remembrance of Allah and the heart is rich with the remembrance of Allah. This is the manner of remembrance by the obedient servants of Allah. And then not do they only remember Allah. What do they do? They also ponder over the creations of the creator. What do they do? They remember Allah while sitting or standing or lying on their sides and they give thoughts. They give thoughts to the creation of the heavens and the earth. And when they ponder over the creations of the universe, what do they do? When they think over, they concentrate. So what do they do? They, this, is a, this is a remarkable combination of remembrance and thinking. And when they, when they do remembrance and thinking and comprehension in this combo, they comprehend the realities of their life. They understand the secrets of the universe and the purpose of the creation of the universe. So when they give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, they say, Oh Lord, oh Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing. Then protect us from the punishments of fire. So these are the knowledge. These are the Ulul Albab who remember Allah, who remember Allah in all conditions, everywhere, all times, and accompanied with remembrance, they look around and they see the creations of the creator, and then they comprehend, they understand the secrets of this universe and the purpose of creation of the universe, and they realize what? That this universe was not created purposeless. It was created with the purpose of what? with the purpose of trial. This is a period of trial. This is an examination hall for the believers. They realize, they realize that this world, this universe is a period of trial. And realizing this, they pray for the success of hereafter to be saved from the trials and torments of hell after. They say what? These knowledgeable, sensible, wise people of wisdom, they supplicate to Allah for what? They say, our Lord, indeed, whoever you admit to fire, you have disgraced them. And for the wrongdoers, there are no helpers. So they, they realize that whoever will be saved from the, from the punishments and from the torments of hellfire will be the successful. They supplicate our Lord. Indeed, we have heard a caller calling to faith, saying, believe in your Lord. And these sensible people do what? They say, we have believed our Lord. So forgive us our sins and remove from us our misdeeds and cause us to die within the righteous. So these are the learned, these are the knowledgeable, these are the wise men who behave how that when they, they learn that somebody is inviting them towards the faith, the sensible people do what? They respond to the call. They respond to the call by faith and belief. And what is the relationship of a sensible bondsman, of a knowledgeable, a wise bondsman to the past, to the present and the future is exactly what I've already explained. That uh, Ulul Albab, they relate to their past saying what? Forgive our sins, seeking forgiveness, repenting and seeking forgiveness. And for the, for the present is what? is eradicating all sins, rectifying themselves, reforming themselves, leaving their sinful manners of their life. And for the future is fear of hereafter. Now, when they respond to Allah and return to Allah with this supplication, what does the Lord answer back? They say, our Lord, and grant us what you promise, what you promised us through your messengers and do not disgrace us on the day of resurrection. Indeed, you do not fail in your promise. And their Lord responded to them, never will I allow to be lost the work of 
any worker among you, whether male or female. Remember, there's no gender discrimination in this world and in hereafter also. You are one of another. So those who emigrate or were evicted from their homes or were harmed in my cause or fought or were killed, I will surely remove from them their misdeeds and I will surely admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow as reward from Allah and Allah has with him the best reward. Be not deceived by the uninhibited movements of the disbelievers throughout the land. It is but a small enjoyment. Then their final refuge is hell. Wretched is the resting place. But those who fear their Lord will have their gardens beneath which rivers flow, abiding eternally therein as an accommodation from Allah. And that which is with Allah is best for the righteous. And indeed, among the people of scripture are those who believe in Allah and what was revealed to you and what was revealed to them, being humbly submissive to Allah. They do not exchange the verses of Allah for a small price. Those will have their rewards with their Lord. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. Allahumma hasibna hisab and yasida. Last verse, verse 200. O oh, you who have believed, persevere and endure and remain stationed and fear Allah that you may be successful. So this is the last verse of Surah Al-Imran where Allah has summarized, has summarized in nutshell the message of the whole of the chapter following the narration of events of Uhud that what four key points you have been taught is, number one, that, oh, believers, the first thing what you need to do is espero, be patient, be patient while obeying the messages, commandments, and teachings and orders of Quran and Hadith. If any social, psychological, emotional, economic issue, calamity, crisis, or hardships befalls you, you stay perseverant, you stay steadfast, and you stay obedient to Allah in full state of patience. This is what Isbiru means. Number two, Swabiru. Swabiru means, number one, extreme and ultimate form, extreme and ultimate form of patience or a superlative degree of perseverance and patience. Or the second meaning is a mutual advice of patience that you you stick up to a superlative degree of patience and perseverance yourself, and you advise each other mutually to be patient and perseverance in the path of Allah also. This is exactly what Allah has explained in another verse, Tawasa bil haqqi wa tawasa bil sabr. This Allah has maintained, explained in Surah Asr as a source of saving ourselves. Tawasa bil haqqi wa tawasa bil sabr is what? It is a this is a point and is a key point to save ourselves from the losses of here and hereafter, as explained in Surah Al-Asr. And the third point, which Allah says, is warabitu. Rabitu, endure and remain stationed. Rabitu has two meanings. Number one is to stay connected, to stay connected, linked up and to stay united. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all the Muslims that at all levels you stay united with mutual love and a love and a feeling of mutual brotherhood and Islamic fraternity. You all stay united against and protect the teachings of Quran against uh, the enemies of Quran, you stay united. And the second meaning of Rabatu is to protect and to guide to protect and guide the teachings of Quran and Hadith, to protect and to guard, to protect and guard the laws and limits of Quran, to protect and guard the boundaries of your Islamic states also. Prophet Sallallahu has been reported to inform all of us that he said that staying to guard, to staying to guard the boundaries of an Islamic state for, for a minute, is better than what is here and hereafter. And then explaining regarding his own priorities also, Prophet said that I, 
I stand to guard the boundaries of my Islamic state. For a moment, I would prefer it to stand in Salah in front of Hajri Aswad, the black stone throughout the night. So this is the importance for struggling and striving for the protection of the Islamic boundaries, of the boundaries of the Islamic state. But remember today, in the period of today, guarding the boundaries of the Islamic state is not just what is important because the wars today, the wars in the modern period of today, they are not being conducted on the geographical boundaries alone. Yes, geographical boundaries are no doubt insecure and they do no doubt they need to be protected and they need to be guarded. The Islamic boundaries of the Islamic states, they do need to be protected and guided. But wars today, not being just carried on on the geographical boundaries. What is being attacked today? The education, the educational, economic, cultural, health spheres are what are being attacked today by the anti-Islamic forces. So the educationalists, the educationalists, the economists, the writers, the doctors, the teachers, the professors, they need to guard the fields which are being attacked by the anti-Islamic powers. And they need to guard their respective fields to implement and to strengthen Islam. And then the last point which Allah suggested here is Wattaqullah. As Allah has mentioned in Quran, Fala that do not fear your enemies. Do not fear the anti-Islam powers and forces Fear whom? Fear Allah, who controls, who controls the whole of the universe, who controls, in whose control is, are the mountains, the rivers, the seas, the oceans, the plates under the earth, and the angels of the heaven. So these are the four points, the pivot points. Isperu wa swabiru wa rabitu wa taqullaha la alla kuntuflihun. The four points for success here and hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are, we cannot show our gratitude enough to help us all go through the message of Surah Al-Imran. Allah accept this all from all of us and help us remember. Help us remember all these messages we received from the verses of Surah Al-Imran. Help us believe in them. Help us, help us adopt all these messages of Quran and help us stay, stay in a state of obedience, in a state of reliance, with full perseverance, with full steadfastness, and in complete patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us, help us move on sarati mustaqim with full patience and perseverance. Rabbibni li'indaka baitan fil jannah. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma hasibna hisab bin yasira. Rabbana la tuzih qalubana ba'da iz hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma. Innaka antal wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastakbiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasipun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen. Summa ameen.